Okay. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, well, welcome everybody. It's so good to see all of you here. And um, how many of you are former PhD students of Stephen? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, several. Um, so uh, the organizers are former PhD students of Stephen, and we took the opportunity to organize this conference and in appreciation of Stephen's uh, dedication to his students. Uh, the time as a, that you spend as a graduate student is a crucial time in the career of a mathematician because you pass from your undergraduate career where you basically take courses and do homework to your career as a research mathematician where you think about hard problems and try to solve them. And this transition happens during graduate school. And I found my thesis upstairs, <laughs> which was written in 1976. And um, there's an acknowledgement on page seven, which I'd like to read. I, I acknowledge Stephen Kleiman, my thesis advisor. Stephen Kleiman, my thesis advisor, was the first one to teach me what it is to do mathematics. He did this by taking an interest in my work and voicing original ideas about where it might lead. His genuine concern about my progress spurred me on. And um, I also thank Quillen and Artman, and my fellow students, some of whom are here. Israel and Rogni were my fellow students. And is Israel here? Yes. yes. Oh, there you are, hi. <laughs> There's so many tiny, tiny faces on the screen. <laughs> I, I have it set to display 49 at a time. Anyway, there's another part of the thesis, which I'd like to read. The, at the, um, the, the first paragraph of the abstract. This thesis aims to develop higher algebraic K theory into a tool for understanding the Chow group of algebraic cycles. The main idea is to relativize the K theory using the notion of flatness. And the word flatness brings an amusing anecdote to mind for me. Um, I, when I was a second year graduate student, I spent an immense amount of time reading articles from the mathematical literature. And one particular article that stuck with me was one by Reynaud and Grousson. And I became interested in it because they discussed what it means, when it can happen that an, an algebra over a ring is a projective module over the ring. And for this work in K-theory, I needed a notion of what a relative module is. And so I told Stephen, I said, well, you know, maybe what a relative module is, is one that's projective. And Stephen said, well, that doesn't sound exactly right. I, probably it should be flatness. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, that's what everybody else uses and it works for them. So, <laughs> so he probably saved me several weeks by <laughs> revealing to me that there was this other notion. <laughs> so I'm immensely grateful to him. And I imagine the um, other students and colleagues of Stephen who are here are also grateful to him. Now, Beverly, are you there? Yes. <laughs> Beverly, do you have something for Stephen? I do. <laughs> and I just can't imagine how it arrived at our doorstep. But here it is. Oh my. I wrapped it because, you know, Dan Grayson uses a lot of tape. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Look at this. Read it first. Oh, read it. <laughs> Presented to Stephen L. Kleinman on the occasion. Oops. <laughs> oh, better. On the occasion <laughs> of your 80th birthday from your former doctoral students with great appreciation and gratitude for all you have done for us. March 31st, 2022. A little early, but. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been a Perfect. great pleasure and honor to uh, have helped you get started. Okay. Okay, that ends my introduction a little bit early, I suppose, five minutes instead of 15. Oh, very good. Well, thank you so much for your introduction. It was really wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it's so good to... Oh, somebody had something to say? Oh. Uh, it was just myself, Steve, but go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it was so nice to see Dan's beard because <laughs> we talked, <laughs> we, we uh, wrote, we corresponded an email about uh, beards <laughs> not too long ago. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine what he looked like in a beard, but it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Eduardo? Yeah, so I was just uh, going to ask if someone uh, has uh, anything to say. Of course, we're going to have the speakers. The speakers will have a lot to say about uh, their math and how it uh, relates to Steve and uh, his, uh, his generosity and his contribution. And, uh, but if anyone else wants to say something now, that's OK. Uh, I, I, I'd like to say a, a quick yeah, hi to yeah. Steve, because I, I'm going to have to sign off because I have to teach, um, but I, I wanted to be here for the introduction. So happy birthday, Steve. And it's oh, really nice you. to see you. And I'm sorry, it's only on a little tiny screen and not <laughs> not in person, but uh, we'll, we'll have your 90th in person. That's for sure. Right. So, so <laughs> right. you, you got to stick around for 90. So uh, <laughs> absolutely. So, but but it's night, nice, and you you look the same as ever. So so. Uh, uh, well, a little whiter, I guess. <laughs> it's it's distinguished. It's, it's distinguished. It's, <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, but I I will have to sign off because I have to. I actually have to go go to campus, and I'm still at home, so I, I have to go to campus and, and teach my ten o'clock class. So, I'll but I'll be back this afternoon. Very good. See you then. Thank you, Dan. Bye. All right. So we're going to uh, uh, proceed according to schedule. It's going to be a long day, 12 talks. So uh, the next talk, uh, the first talk is going to be by Tony at, uh, oh, in uh, maybe I can, in 12 minutes from now. <laughs> Everybody's in a time zone different. So it's 12 <laughs> minutes from now. I uh, will stop recording now and I'll start again at, uh, I mean, I mean, when Tony is about to talk, so. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the, this lovely meeting, uh, Anthony Rangachev who unfortunately I, I didn't have the opportunity to to meet in person before so, we met we met in brazil oh, did. <laughs> yes <laughs> oh, okay so remind me when <laughs> many times <laughs> oh, really? but i was a graduate student then so uh, a, bit un, a bit unnoticeable <laughs> okay. so anthony from the Bulgarian Academy of Science uh, uh, will be the first speaker. And uh, I'll ask him to say the title himself. Yeah, I will, I will share my screen in a second. But uh, first, uh, I wanted to say a few words uh, about Steve. Um, I think I'm his most recent graduate student. I graduated in 2017, uh, but I was also his uh, undergraduate student. So we first uh, met uh, when I was a sophomore at MIT and I took his uh, graduate course in uh, commutative algebra. Uh, at the time I was not interested in algebraic geometry, I was interested in number theory. And I had taken uh, graduate courses in uh, algebraic number theory and analytic number theory. Uh, but then things changed when I was in my junior year, there was this uh, meeting 
uh, of MIT faculty with the undergraduate students uh, that took place in the Royal East restaurant in uh, Cambridge. I remember that evening very well, very vividly. Uh, and then I met again with Steve and we talked and uh, he suggested we talk more in his office the following day. And uh, I remember him giving me uh, uh, this uh, biography of Oskar Zariski called The Unreal Life of Oskar Zariski. And I remember reading that book for two nights. And I was uh, very fascinated with uh, Zariski. Uh, at the time, I knew only what Zariski topology was. Uh, I had taken a course in topology with George Lustig, and I remember we studied Zariski topology, and that was it. Uh, but uh, his life uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, I'm very much. I was very much familiar with the con with the context of his life uh, and uh, uh, him being a Eastern European, and also initially interested in number theory resonated with me. And uh, this is how I started working as an undergraduate student, uh, as an undergraduate student uh, on uh, equisingularity theory. Uh, it's a topic that uh, Zariski was involved uh, in the last uh, two decades of his professional life. Um, so that's how my um, work in uh, uh, algebraic geometry started. Then I became a student of uh, Terry Gaffney and Steve Kleiman, a PhD student. I graduated in 2017, uh, and uh, uh, in, uh, just before the pandemic occurred, uh, uh, we were expecting you at the University of Chicago. At the time, I was a Dixon instructor at the University of Chicago, and uh, the pandemic interrupted these plans. Uh, uh, so I hope to be able to uh, see you very soon, Steve. So uh, let me, uh, ah, and before going into math, let me say one one last sentence that Steve supported me quite a lot mathematically, but also in life. And uh, for this, uh, I, I'm in, uh, eternally grateful to you. So let me share my screen now. Can you see it? Okay. So the title is uh, The Evolving Notion of multiplicity, and uh, I will um, talk about uh, some classical notions uh, of how the multiplicity of a, at the point of a complex analytic variety evolved. Uh, and the driving force of this evolution was applications in equisingularity theory. And the focus of this talk will be uh, on uh, Kleinman's uh, work on equisingularity theory. I will uh, omit a big part of the history here because of uh, the time constraint and uh, I, uh, I apologize for this. Uh, so given a reduced equidimensional complex analytic variety, dimension D, um, we know how to define the multiplicity at a point as this uh, uh, number uh, where the minimum is taken over all linear spaces of dimension n minus d, subspaces of Cn, such that this intersection is an isolated point. So this is a classical uh, definition that, uh, for example, one can uh, uh, find in Mumford's book on complex uh, varieties, complex ah. projective varieties. Um, then uh, if X is uh, a hypersurface, we have uh, a, an easy way to compute this uh, multiplicity. Uh, we, um, so we assume that F is complex analytic uh, in a neighborhood of X. And so we can develop, we can look at the Taylor expansion of F around this point. Uh, and uh, we can of course present F as a sum of uh, um, degree n part, or degree n plus one part, and so on. And uh, the minimum uh, non-vanishing such part uh, is uh, uh, the degree of it that gives us the multiplicity at x. So, uh, so here is a definition of equisingularity. As I said, we would like to study multiplicities from that point of view. Um, we'll say that, uh, um, uh, two germs are topologically equisingular 
uh, if I have an ambient in CN, if I have an ambient homomorphism uh, that sends well and two neighborhoods of x not and x one uh, such that uh, um, um, th that homomorphism restricts on, on to, uh, to a homomorphism of, of, of the germs. So here is a definition that you're all familiar with. Um, let's say reference for it is uh, Neuner's book, the link of X in X is this intersection of X with a sphere of dimension two n minus one. If uh, X is an isolated singularity, then this link is a compact smooth real manifold and the topological type of X near X can be understood from this uh, compact smooth real manifold and it's embedding in, in the sphere. So given that, it's easy to see that if we look at these two plane uh, curve singularities, X naught and X one, uh, one is the cusp, the other one is the node. Well, they have uh, multiplicity too at the origin, but uh, they have uh, different topological types. So one would be <laughs> naively be able to detect uh, the topological type with the multiplicity, but this is uh, not uh, the case. And of course, we have uh, this famous uh, statement uh, called the risk is multiplicity conjecture that says that to reduce hypersurface germs, if two such uh, hypersurface germs are topologically equisingular, they then have the same uh, multiplicity. So I think the community is split and uh, some believe it's correct, others believe it's not. Uh, it's, uh, there, there, there's some uh, proofs of it in uh, uh, special cases. Um, so, in general, if you just if you are presented with two germs, uh, it's very hard hard to decide if these two germs are equi equisingular. By the way, in this talk, I will uh, be mostly focused on topological equisingularity, but they are uh, different types of equisingularity. For example, one might ask. Uh, one might say that two germs are uh, equisingular if they have a similar resolution uh, process. Uh, so one has to clarify uh, uh, um, what type of equisingularity uh, uh, we look at. Um, but if, if the germs are just uh, two abstract germs uh, not connected to each other, then it's very hard. Uh, uh, to, to, to say if they're uh, equisingular with uh, numerical tools. But then if they're part of the family, then it's somewhat easier. And then uh, you, you, one would impose conditions uh, that depend on the total family and one would like to control these uh, conditions with uh, fiberwise uh, invariants. And in our case, this will be uh, multiplicities. So here I'm going to recall uh, uh, the perhaps most basic uh, uh, equisingularity condition that uh, of Whitney and Tom, um, uh, so, which uh, uh, leads to what's called differential equisingularity. And most equisingularity conditions imply a, a differential equisingularity. So um, the, the family setup uh, comes from, uh, uh, in a natural way, from stratification uh, theory. Uh, so given a complex analytic variety, you would like to uh, stratify it in such a way so that nearby strata, in this case, X minus Y and Y, uh, satisfy some compatibility uh, conditions. And uh, these compatibility conditions will be uh, uh, described with uh, limits of uh, lines and limits of uh, tangent hyperplanes. Uh, so let me recall uh, this. So Whitney, uh, so X minus Y and Y are Whitney strata. So Whitney proved that every complex analytic variety admits a stratification such that nearby strata, X minus Y, Y, uh, satisfy this compatibility condition. So whenever you, we have a sequence of points X, I from X minus Y and Y, I from Y, both converging uh, to the origin. And suppose that uh, we have a, uh, we look at the limits of lines, xi, uh, yi, and uh, the limits of uh, tangent hyperplanes, and we know this limit by h0. 
So the condition says that L0 uh, is in uh, H0. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, an old theorem uh, due to uh, Whitney. And how do we turn this into a family setup? Well, we, um, because Y is smooth locally, I can identify it with uh, uh, linear space CK, uh, then I can assume that X is embedded in CN times CK, and then I can consider the projection from C and CK uh, uh, onto uh, Y. Uh, and then X can be viewed as a total space uh, of this family uh, where, yeah, given with respect to this projection map. And uh, we have this uh, isotopy result due to Tom and Matter uh, uh, that if uh, X uh, 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 minus Y, Y is, uh, um, satisfies the Whitney conditions. Um, so this is what, in fact, I, I omit certain things. This is uh, what was uh, called Whitney B condition. Uh, so then Tom and Matter proved that, uh, 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 that the family is topologically trivial. Okay, so X is uh, homomorphic to X naught times Y. This uh, homomorphism is ambient. Okay, so it's from C and plus K to C and plus K. And we say that this family is Whitney equisingular. So now, naturally, uh, well, the, the Whitney equisingularity was understood from this topological and complex analytic perspective, but there were attempts starting from the 60s and mostly in the 70s to turn this into algebraic geometry. And the, one of the key um, um, objects uh, here uh, uh, is the conormal space. Uh, so this is uh, defined as the closure uh, uh, at uh, smooth points of uh, uh, these pairs. Uh, X is a smooth point and H is a tangent hyperplane. Uh, it means that this is a plane that contains the, the tangent space. Um, so initially Whitney conditions were not uh, interpreted in terms of conormal spaces, but in terms of Grossmannians, in terms of tangent spaces. Uh, so I'll say a few words about this. So this um, uh, reinterpre reinterpretation of uh, Whitney conditions occurred in the eighties. And uh, it was uh, done by Henri Moreau and Tessier, but also in the eighties, there was a, other developments uh, uh, that involved conormal spaces. So conormal spaces are better behaved than tangent spaces uh, and tangent bundles. Uh, so I, here I would like to mention uh, Steve's uh, uh, well-known article about the conormal scheme. So it's uh, in the proceedings of a conference in Catania uh, in 83. Um, and their conormal spaces, uh, well, he did this foundational work on conormal schemes, but the motivation was the contact formulas, uh, contact uh, theory of, uh, uh, well, the enumer enumerative theory of contacts uh, and uh, his work with uh, Fulton and M McPherson. Uh, on it. But then in the 80s, late, later 80s, well, here I would say, yeah, let's say that it's in the 80s, uh, first half of the 80s, uh, Tessier expressed uh, uh, the Whitney conditions in terms of algebraic geometry. Uh, that happened in also in the 70s, but not with conormal spaces. So if you consider the conormal space C of X and projection to X, and you blow up the conormal space with respect to the inverse image of Y, the exceptional di divisor, uh, remember Y is a subspace of, uh, it's this, this smooth CK subspace of X, the exceptional divisor uh, gives you this um, mm, uh, correspondence of limits of uh, um, secant lines and, uh, and tangent hyperplanes. So Tessier proved that uh, the family uh, is Whitney equi singular uh, if and only if this exceptional divisor of this blow up has equidimensional fibers. In other words, the exceptional divisor does not have vertical components, components that surject, uh, 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 that's, 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 that's components of the exceptional divisor such that under uh, this uh, composite map, uh, their image is a proper, strictly proper close subset of 
of x. Okay. Uh, the, the exception of divisor may fail to be flat. That's not, not a problem, but yeah. So just we, we require equidimensionality of the fibers. And so then now it's as a further step in this uh, project of turning this into uh, and turning this uh, equisingularity, differential equisingularity in algebraic geometry, uh, we need to find an algebraic description of uh, the conormal space. Uh, so I will uh, use coordinates and uh, functions here. There is, of course, better way uh, to do it uh, uh, using the conormal to normal diagram. But uh, yeah, let's uh, let's just uh, keep this as simple as possible. So I can uh, I can have fiber variables. I can split my variables locally at the origin in fiber variables and parameter variables, and I can look at the Jacobian matrix with all variables. And uh, the module that's generated by the column space uh, is um, uh, it's called the Jacobian module, which we denote by J of X. Um, then we can consider the Riesz algebra of uh, this uh, module. It's the subalgebra. So this module is contained in, in a free module of rank P. So we can consider the symmetric algebra of this uh, free module. It's a polynomial ring in P variables. And the subalgebra generated by the Jacobian module we view the generators as some linear forms in this linear poly, yeah, polynomials degree one. <laughs> well, yeah, linear forms. Uh, 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 so this subalgebra is what's called uh, the Riesz algebra. Equivalently, one can get it by looking at the symmetric algebra of the Jacobian module and uh, modding out by torsion. So then uh, in the late 80s, Gaffney observed that uh, the conormal space is just this approach of the Riesz algebra of the Jacobian module. Look, if, if X is just given by a single equation, if we're in the hypersurface case, then this Riesz algebra of the Jacobian module, this is the Riesz algebra of the Jacobian ideal. So that's the blow up of X with respect to the Jacobian ideal. And that's what gives you the Nash uh, uh, modification. So this is an important. Um, uh, 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 special case to keep in mind. And we can form the relative Jacobian matrix. So this is, uh, oof, uh, this is X, uh, I'm sorry. So this is uh, my mistake. So it's from uh, X1 to Xn. Okay, so just uh, with respect to the fiber variables, not YK, but this goes to Xn. Uh, so the relative uh, Jacobian matrix, and then we have the relative conormal space, which is the approach of this, um, this algebra. So then uh, a bit important here, and there are many steps here that I omit, but I can say that this is a result due to Gaffney, Kleiman, and Tessier, is that Whitney B or Whitney equisingularity is equivalent to asking that this exceptional, the exceptional divisor of this blow up has equidimensional fibers. So remember in Tessier's uh, uh, result, uh, the result, it's the same result, but for the conormal space. So he blows up the entire conormal space. So here, uh, one, uh, well, they show that one can replace the conormal space with the relative uh, version and get this equivalence. And this is important because the relative conormal space is a fiber wise object, it restricts to the conormal spaces of the fiber, whereas the total conormal space does not. So this equivalence is important if one wants to build a fiber-wise numerical um, invariance. And so the first case to consider is the case of hypersurfaces when X is a hypersurface. So let me recall here the definition of the hilbert samuel multiplicity uh, for an M primary ideal J uh, for L high enough, large enough, uh, we uh, know that this function is a polynomial and Ej is a positive integer called the Hilbert sum of multiplicity. And when J is the maximal ideal, then this invariant coincides with the multiplicity of Z at Z that we defined in the very beginning. Uh, Anthony. Yeah. It's just a quick reminder about uh, your time. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, so, uh, he, so we have, uh, so we have the relative conormal space here, which is the blow up with, uh, the res with respect to the relative Jacobian ideal. Uh, 
So, okay, I just specialized this setup to hypersurfaces and we have a uh, uh, Pesius result that uh, gives that Whitney with singularity is equivalent to the constancy of this uh, Hubert Samuel uh, multiplicity. And uh, well, we have this example that this multiplicity here in the case of this cusp node family, it's not when we use this uh, Jacobian ideal times the maximal ideal, then it detects that these fibers are not topologically uh, the same. So then um, I will, I will uh, perhaps uh, very briefly say that we have a generalization of the Hubert Simon multiplicity to modules. It's called the books boundary multiplicity. Um, and uh, Gaffney and Kleiman prove this is their important contribution in their Inventionist paper in uh, the 90s, that if we have a family of isolated complete intersections, then we need another multiplicity that generalizes the Hilbert Simon multiplicity to modules. Uh, and uh, Whitney with singularity in this case is equivalent uh, to the constancy of this uh, Buxbaum multiplicity. So then I want to here very briefly uh, say something, an application of this Buxbaum multiplicity. It's a general formula, a Plucker formula uh, for complete intersections. So if you have a, a complete intersection and fix a linear space of co-dimension to in general position, you can define this D prime, this intersection, where L prime is the chunk for, yeah, C1 of, of the hyperplane class, then D1 is equal to the number of points in the small part of Z, such that the tangent space at Z and A span a hyperplane. And if Z is uh, a complete intersection, with given by the vanishing of homogeneous polynomials with certain degrees. So the degree of Z by Bezu is their product. We set this pi, this number, and then we have this generalized plucker the kleiman uh, formula. And so here, well, <laughs> let me give the formula just a few seconds. So here, uh, uh, here um, you, we have uh, three, Heroes of uh, equisingularity theory. Uh, this is a picture in uh, Terry Gaffney's home from 2018. Uh, there was a special AMS session on singularities at Northeastern University. This is Steve, Terry, and Bernard. And I will skip this part. So uh, just for if you want to handle families of arbitrary isolated singularities, you need to uh, define a, a volume function, local volume. Uh, this is the last generalization of the multiplicity. Of, uh, of a complex analytic variety at the point. I will skip it. Uh, I'll just uh, say that we have same result uh, for families of arbitrary isolated singularities uh, with this new invariant that was developed over the past uh, 10, 15 years. And I will conclude with uh, this picture of me and Steve at IMPA. Uh, we had a wonderful time uh, together. We shared an office uh, a few years ago I was still a graduate student. Uh, this was a very, very productive time and very enjoyable. Happy birthday, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll have time for uh, one question or a comment. If not, uh, maybe we could go ahead uh, with our next uh, speaker, Nagni Pina, who will make uh, a talk. Uh, I, I mean, the title is long, is Long <laughs> Papers Journey into Archive. And uh, uh, you have uh, uh, the word now, Ragni. Yeah, let me.
Okay, can you see the <clears throat> can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I stole the title from Eugene O'Neill and I want to say to, to stress that it's not the paper that is long, that it's really its journey that is long because it's taken almost 30 years. <laughs> but we finished. <laughs> so let me start with, uh, with the brief timeline. In uh, around 1994, there was a program at the Center for Advanced Study at the Academy in Oslo and Steve was a visitor. And we were talking about many things, but especially uh, there was the physicists Di Francesco and Itzikson who had gotten interested in enumerative geometry of plane curves, especially nodal curves in the plane. Uh, and then of course there was the important work by Israel uh, counting nodal curves on a surface, a general surface in terms of churn classes of uh, churn numbers of the system. And um, to continue, there was a uh, program at the Institute Mittag Leffler in 1996 97. And again, Steve was there, as was I. And <clears throat> at the time, this was sort of on quantum cohomology and uh, Gromovitten invariants, and of course, nodal curves on surfaces. And I'll get back to a little bit more later, but let me just uh, first do the timeline here. So there was Götze's conjecture, which was which appeared in 1998, but of course he did the work before that uh, with his uh, conjecture on the generating function of nodal curves uh, for a surface. And uh, in 1997, there was a conference in Bologna. Uh, both Steve and I were there. Uh, Steve gave a talk and uh, on our work at the time on the enumerative geometry or the enumerative enumerating singular curves on surfaces and we meant to publish this paper in the Bologna proceedings but we didn't make the deadline so that was the first uh, why first reason this became a very long journey <laughs> we didn't make the deadline but then there was a conference for Hitzebrook's 70th birthday in Warsaw and which I attended and I gave a talk on our work and we managed actually to meet the deadline. Uh, maybe we should have spent more time, but anyway, we did publish our paper in the proceedings of the Hirtzebro conference. So then it became the H paper. And now <clears throat> there was, this was uh, not complete. So we continued five years later, we published a paper, which I call the methods and application paper, which I will get back to. Uh, and then in 2011, there was the Lynx paper and Lynx because it was published in the <coughs> Rendiconti Lynchae, the Academy in Rome, which has a Lynx as, as its sort of logo. Uh, this was about arbitrarily near points and request diagrams in Hilbert schemes. I'll say more about it. And then finally, the fourth paper in this series, uh, we were able to put on the archive in February of this year. So at least we made it before Steve's 80th birthday. Hooray. <laughs> Not so bad. And I should say that <laughs> in this timeline, of course, both of us did a lot of other things, but uh, we had this long project. Uh, we would work on it, uh, of course, with email, never on Skype and never on Zoom. But when we were at the same place, for example, MIT or in Oslo, in Rio, in Belo Horizonte, and wherever we happened to be uh, at the same time, we would find some time to work on uh, finishing, especially on finishing this paper, which is now finished. So let me say a little bit about the Mittag Leffler uh, program. So here is here is a piece from the Steve's contribution to the proceedings of the Mittag Leffler uh, year. And you see this was a recursive formula for nodal curves on a Hitzebrook surface, which it says we did this in March, 1994. So probably in Oslo at the, at the CAS. 
And uh, this is, of course, a generalization of Konsevich's uh, recursion relation for plane curves. But it just follows from this associativity equation in the quantum cohomology. Now, in the Bologna lecture, so Steve on, September, on uh, December 17 in 1997, Steve gave a talk at the Bologna conference. Uh, the setting was a smooth surface, an invertible sheaf, and the number of interest is the number of R nodal curves in the general codimension R linear subsystem of the linear system of L. And uh, <clears throat> the conjecture, everybody's conjecture, of course, was that NRL is a polynomial in the four churn numbers of this system. And <clears throat> he referred to Weinsenker's computations for R at most seven. And he referred to our work for seven and eight. But as he said in his lecture, for R equals eight remains residual intersection theory in proof. And this is what we have actually fixed uh, in the last paper. <laughs> and of course, he also mentions Gutsch's conjecture for the generating function. So this goes back to 97 in Bologna. Now, here is the paper which became the H paper. Uh, I will not go into details uh, because there is, so we gave uh, a proof, but uh, which valid for R equals uh, at most seven, but for R equals eight, there was a missing thing that we said that we referred to the paper that we published now in February <coughs> as a paper to appear. And we also referred to this paper in the H paper, we referred to this paper, even though we gave it a different name in that uh, first uh, thing. And this is more sort of applications, uh, validity of the questions of validity of the formulas, because one thing is to find the formulas. I mean, one thing is to find, <clears throat> to show that universal polynomials exist, then you need to know what they are, and then you need to know when they're valid. So here we addressed uh, validity questions quite a lot. And here is the links, the links paper, which was slightly, um, should I say, maybe more general. We consider a smooth family of surfaces and we consider arbitrarily near points on this family. So it means that we uh, make sequences of blowing ups and uh, uh, we <clears throat> also considered Enrique's diagrams, and we could. Uh, one thing that we did was to define inside the relative Hilbert scheme uh, what is often referred to as a geometric subset <clears throat> corresponding to <clears throat> the set of, uh, <clears throat> sorry, Enrique's clusters that have the diagram, the Enrique's di given Enrique's diagram. And this is something which has come up in uh, uh, by people uh, later, but which I also will <coughs> get back to. So that was the third paper. And then finally, this is the fourth paper. And uh, I should say that the proof that we eventually gave in this paper of the R equals eight case is uh, not as we had hoped, because we had hoped to give a proof that could be generalized to arbitrary number of nodes. And that could also be more directly computed by, by an algorithm. And um, we had to settle, I mean, since we needed just to get this paper out of the way, we had to settle for an ad hoc proof. And it's rather technical and uh, I'll get <clears throat> into a little bit what goes into the proof, sorry. <coughs> okay, so. <coughs> Sorry. So we have a smooth projective family of surfaces and the relative effective divisor. The base is Cohen Macaulay and equidimensional. And then we look at the set of points in Y such that the curve dy has R nodes. And then we say that under certain precise genericity conditions, which has to do with codimension conditions on 
outside. There's a problem with your uh, uh, It's either empty or it has mentioned R in either polynomial. Uh, sorry. Who said something? Yeah, your sound was, was kind of distorted. Can you not hear me? Okay, no, it said okay. my connection was unstable, but yeah, That's, it's okay. Okay, so, so the PR is the r polynomial and the AIs are pushdowns of universal polynomials in the term classes of the family. And of course, the conjecture is that this should hold for all R. <coughs> and we have explicit formulas for the AR. <clears throat> so what goes into the proof? I've already mentioned various things. Enriquez diagrams, arbitrarily linear points, so risky clusters and complete ideals, <clears throat> relative Hilbert schemes, recursive relation. This is a key thing that we pass from, say from R minus one nodes to R nodes and the process is that we consider the given family and then we make new families by blowing up uh, at the nodes of the curves so that we get families with less nodes. And then we can push down an R minus one node polynomial to the R node family. Then we have to correct for non-reduced curves. So non-reduced curves appear in this process when we have quadruple points. And we have quadruple points when R, when we're looking for nodal curves with at least with R uh, equals to H or more. Then the curves kind of quadruple points and I'll show how these fibers exist. <coughs> the intersection theory we use is uh, generally even more bit general than what is in Fulton's chapter 17 for those who know that book, I guess all of you. And uh, finally, in order to uh, assert that our, fam our formulas are independent of the given family, we use the versal deformation space of a quadruple point, which means that it only depends on the analytic type of the singularity. And then we show that actually it does not depend on the analytic type of the family. But anyway, so this is, these are things that go into the proof. Here's a typical uh, Enriquez diagram. <coughs> you see, when you blow up this singularity, you get a Fibonacci singularity of type 5.3. When you blow up this singularity, you get one of type 3.2. And then you get one of type 2.1, which is just an ordinary cusp. So you can read sort of the blowing up process from this Enriquez diagram just to give you an example. And here is the kind of pictures we were sending back and forth. Here we have arbitrary linear points. We have our family F over Y, and then we make a new family where the uh, surfaces of the new family are blown ups of the surfaces of the first family and so on. And we have <clears throat> certain loci we consider X4 is the set of quadruple points in the family of curves. <coughs> and over those quadruple points, we get this non-reduced behavior, <coughs> which are fibers which look like this. So we have, we had the quadruple point, we blow it up, then we get the strict transform of the curve union actually four times the exceptional divisor that we removed twice in our process, the exceptional divisor, but we're still left with a non-reduced thing. And that's what makes, and then we continue blowing up and we see that this property of having non-reduced fibers propagates in, in the blow up thing. And this is what we have to deal with. And when we said we had to 
deal with sort of residual intersection because of non-reduced fiber. This is what, this is sort of the situation that comes up. And of course we did blackboard work. This is from Oslo, I don't remember which year, <laughs> but it's sort of typical here. We wanted to get rid of the <coughs> non-reduced thing right away, but uh, that never really worked out. So, so this was sort of a false uh, start. <coughs> How am I doing time-wise? Yeah, I'll, I'm getting to the end. So related work and the conjecture. So Lara Kir in his thesis showed part of our conjecture. He proved that for all, for all R, UR can be expressed as a universal polynomial in pushdowns of monomials in the churn classes of the family. But he did not prove the shape of the polynomials, that they're actually belt polynomials. And he applied his motivation was to apply this to the numeration of nodal plane curves in P3. So then the plane is a varying plane in P3, and we look at nodal plane curves in this varying plane. And similar applications have also been done by, by these people. And uh, now what we can, uh, what we of course conjecture is that we can find universal polynomials given any type of multi-singularity. So we have an Enriquez diagram will give us a response to a given multi-singularity topological type. And <clears throat> we can look at the set of all curves or the points such that the fibers have this uh, type of multi-singularity. And of course, we conjecture that this class can be expressed as universal polynomial in pushdowns of monomials in the germ classes of the family. And this, uh, <coughs> there are several examples of this being true. <coughs> and it has been proved in the case that the family is trivial, so that there is a constant surface, not uh, the surface is not varying. This was done by Li and Tseng and also by Renemo. Uh, and also even for Renamo did it also for varieties of higher dimension, isolated singularities of higher dimensional varieties. And I should mention the work of Kazarian, who computed many explicit formulas for uh, curves with a given multi-singularity, and again on a fixed surface by using Tom polynomials and what he calls residual poly polynomials. And there is a very recent paper by Bergsy and Senes. It appeared in December uh, of last year. And they developed a new approach to the study of multipoint loci of holomorphic maps between complex manifolds. And they say motivated by ideas of Kazarian and Rimani on Tom polynomials and residual polynomials. And so there are lots of things here which could be explored uh, in order to uh, actually prove uh, this conjecture here. I mean, it's, it's a question of making <coughs> relative a process which is known in the sort of uh, constant family case. And this is a little bit like Larry did when he <coughs> made, took uh, the proof by Cole, Shanda and Thomas uh, of uh, Yotch's conjecture and made it relative. So I think this is something which one should be able to do. And with this, I'm sorry for my uh, voice. With this, happy birthday, Steve. This is from 20 years ago in Oslo. And I guess most of you are here. Unfortunately, there is one person we miss greatly and that is Dan Luxo. Thank you. Thanks, Ragni. That, that Thank you, Ragni. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but what, I don't know what happened to my voice. I did have COVID, but it, it's long ago, so it shouldn't have, <laughs> shouldn't have been mm. that. <laughs> Any questions? Or remarks? Uh, well, thank you for remembering Dan. For, it's, yes, uh, we miss him. We miss him. Yes, indeed. 
I have a question. Well, oh, this is Gary Kennedy. Um, so what is it what is it that works up till seven nodes and then goes wrong when you get to eight nodes? It's the appearance of quadruple points. In our process, we have to deal with families with non-reduced fibers. That's what goes wrong. And up to seven, we, we don't have uh, we don't need to deal with quadruple points. <laughs> So it's, uh, it, it's simple, but it's, yeah. Okay, I'll stop sharing then. Any other question or remark? Well, I might add that, um, in the range between four, a quadruple point and um, a quintuple point, uh, there is uh, a number of R there, I think up until 16, is it, Rodney? Yeah. Uh, it might be uh, easier to handle those cases. We tried to do that for a while without yeah. going on yeah. beyond. Um, yeah, we should it, be able we should be able to to actually go further, but uh, we sort of settled just to <laughs> finish with the eight case. <coughs> uh, can I can I have a question, Rani? Yes, yeah, okay. Sorry, this is maybe just a very naive one. So we do this blow up process. Is there you see any relation of the? Is this some sort of what you get? Is there a morphism from that, or is there some sort of blow up of some geometric subset of the relative Hilbert scheme? Uh, so, so in the blow up, what we do yeah, is so we, kind we of, take the diagonal, blow we blow up the diagonal. Yeah. So, so you have this blow up process where you kind of you blow up, um, you know, this family of surface yeah. along double yeah. points, and then you do. I guess you iterate it. Then, then we do a rest restriction yeah. uh, of this uh, new blown up family to, to the locus of double points. Yes. And then we modify the, the divisor. I see. So, by, by subtracting twice the exceptional divisor. And then we get a new family where, where we look for curves with one less nodes, less yeah. node. But, 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 but it's not kind of what I mean is that there's this sort of this um, Hubris scheme parameterizing uh, the locus where you know yeah, the, the geometric are, subsets and, and when they collide it's a natural compactification of that is you take some the compactification in in a, in a hybrid scheme of points mm -hmm. and 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 i just wonder if if you see whether was the relation of your blown up what you get after blowing up this stuff uh, with the original hybrid scheme if it, it makes sense maybe i just um yeah i'm not sure i understand mm -hmm. quite uh yeah, okay, so yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, this is sort of what we deal with it uh, in in what I call the links paper. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's, yeah. No, I have geometric to, I have, subsets I have, I really are, are, are defined in there, yeah. No, I really have to, to look into the details and yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we should continue discussing, <laughs> but maybe not now. <laughs> maybe. Okay, so we're kind of pressed to the with time with the schedule. Let's thank uh, Ryan again and uh, uh, go on to the next speaker. Who is Ian Kleppe? Yeah, hello. Do you hear me? Yes, yeah. I hear you loud and clear, yes. I don't see you on my screen, but uh, I can hear you. Oh, yes. Do you see me now? Yeah, I, I see your PDF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see you now as well. Yeah, good.
Should I begin or? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, hello to everyone listening. Uh, some faces are known to me and some are not, but anyway, uh, nice to meet you in this way. And I want to thank the uh, organizers for the invitation to speak. And it will be about uh, our co my cooperation with Steve on Macaulay duality over any base. First, do you see the whole screen or? Yes. Do you see the whole screen I am uh, written? Yes. Yeah, good. <clears throat> First, I want to congratulate you, Steve, so much on almost 80. In not so far as six, in 80 years. Uh, in not so far as 60 of these years, you have been a prominent mathematician of the mathematical community community, starting with works on ampleness and a prestigious publication in Annals in 1966, which, by the way, was a year I started my university studies. <laughs> and the first talk I heard you gave was at a conference in Oslo in 1970. Hironaka gave a talk, and a quite young man named Steve also gave a talk. Through the years, you have co-worked with so many, and very recently, we started working together. It has been a privilege for me to work with you for more than four years on Macaulay duality and its geometry. It started by an archive preprint paper, uh, archive preprint from December 2017 by Bert on et al, smoothable Gornstein points, and with the title you see, let h of n be this Hilbert vector. The main result there was that the graded Artinian k algebras with Hilbert function h of 7 are smoothable. Note that this was, not that they are not smoothable if n is different from 7 in at least the range 6 to 12 by a spring lecture note of Jarub Kanov and Jarub Binov. Back to the preprint, they consider a non-empty open subset, I call it p goer of h, of the projective space of cubic forms apolar to the graded Artinian K algebra with Hilbert function H, and they assert that Pigor can be embedded in the appropriate punctual Hilbert scheme. References for the latter seem missing, even though they refer to papers for the bijection furnished by apolarity. The point is, of course, that a bijection of sets may not be an isomorphism of schemes. So Steve uh, had some emails with Tony, as in uh, Tony and yeah, 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 Tony and Karnov's uh, spring election out there. There's a construction of a map from Gore of H to the Hilbert scheme for some age. Tony suggests including me in the discussion as some morphisms appear in some of my papers. And uh, there is a paper from 98 about smoothness and dimension of Pigor, and there is another in uh, transactions. Um, <clears throat> and there is a third one, in fact, on the level case. Let me say a few words. On uh, of how our cooperation started. <clears throat> Let P of Gore be the determinant of C of forms of degree S in Pn, given by requiring the catalytic and matrices to have ranks given by the Hilbert function. Also, let's um, Gore of H 
be the set of S flat graded Artinian Gornstein quotients of R sub S with Hilbert function H for all fibers. Then the functor Gore of H uh, is representable by a result in uh, the first paper or repeated somehow in the next both proofs use flattening stratification. In the first paper, its proof is only sketched. In the letter, it contains more details. But in the next, next last sentence, please replace by kernel by co-kernel. By the universal property of Gorov H, there is a schemeorphism from P Gor of H with reduced scheme structure into Gorov H, which by definition of P Gor, because by definition of P Gor there is a universal S form which via polarity defines a family of graded Artinian Gornstein quotients over P of Gor with constant Hilbert function. Does this family is flat, flat? And also does this pi above exist as a family with constant Hilbert function over an integral domain is flat? Um, just a few, uh, one more word about this in the other paper. Um, it's with more details here. And um, um, it states uh, that the bijection given by pi uh, above between p gor and gor of h is an isomorphism of topological spaces. In the proof, I try to include enough details to see that their dimensions are equal, uh, the dimensions you see displayed, um, um, which of course is the case if uh, the, uh, the spaces uh, are topologically isomorphic. But this was in fact what I need there because this implies that gor H is smooth at A, if and only if P gor H is smooth at A, as it was known that their tangent spaces coincided. For the P gor case, it's again in Panev, Yarabino's spring lecture now. Steve and I discussed this in several emails. And we agreed upon trying to generalize the above so that Macaulay duality defines a bijection on their correspond, corresponding sets of k points with k any neutralian ring. Indeed, such a functorial bijection is exactly what we need to get pi above with red removed to be an isomorphism of it. In fact, I think at that time, Steve already had good ideas of how to prove it. Anyway, the setup was now the following KN in the Therian ring, A and A graded K algebra. C star is a K dual of a module C. We have categories F resp G sub A of filtered respectively graded A modules, and we call an A module C Artinian if it's locally free of finite rank over K. We let MA be the category of A modules, and AM or AF or AG is a A, the full subcategory of K Artinian modules as filtered, as graded. In addition, we take B a graded A module with BP locally free of rank BP. 
uh, set B dagger in degree Q equal to the K dual of B in degree minus Q. And let B dagger, this direct sum there, be the graded dual of B. Then B dagger uh, in Q is locally free of rank B minus Q. Moreover, set up of a polarity for any A module I of B sub module I of B. We define its a polar annihilator to be a submodule of B dagger, namely consists of those F of B dagger such that F times I is zero. For D, a submodule of B dagger, we define the annihilator correspondingly. And we equip B and B dagger and also sub portions of B and B dagger with the induced filtrations. A little more to the setup, define the note by um, C sub B, res delta sub B dagger. The A sub module I of B, res D of B dagger, with B slash I Artinian, K Artinian, respectively D uh, Artinian, and with the co kernel there, B dagger of slash D flat over K. Um, now, just put a capital F before C and delta to restrict to their filtered object. And include an upper H, uppercase H, to restrict to Hilbert function, object with Hilbert function H. Similarly, for the homogeneous case, take an H in front of it. Moreover, a contravariant function D from a category as to itself is called dualizing if D square is naturally isomorphic to the identity function. Then we have the uh, generalization of Macaulay duality. Take I and map it to its annihilator. This gives uh, the bijection uh, of C sub B with delta sub B dagger. With inverse, again, similarly take, taking D to its annihilator. And this annihilator in B dagger is in fact B slash I the dual and correspondingly for the last expression. Further, if B is A and I and D correspond, then I uh, slash I is a K-algebra and D is a dualizing functor for this Artinian uh, category. Also, D is K-Gordenstein if its dual model is cyclic for any of its residue fields. The bijection restricts to a bijection between the corresponding filter, which restricts to a third bijection between the homogeneous elements of these objects. These two bijections commute with taking associated graded modules. Uh, I will not say much about the proof in this, uh, but it's quite easy somehow. Uh, you, if you take an element i in C slash B, 
we get an exact sequence I in B and C, and we just dualize it. And we have to be careful to see that C star maps into B dagger, which is a smaller module uh, than uh, B, uh, the dual object. So some care all the way we have to do in that proof. An interesting uh, thing uh, we feel is that Gorenstein linkage and Macaulay do coincide up to shift, as I call it. Uh, more precisely, I assume A is Artinian and Gorenstein and fix an isomorphism with A and its dual using a tensor product with a such exist. If I is an ideal, with B uh, equal A slash I Artinian, just set J equal this hum and C equal A slash J. Then I is this hum and this means that I and J are directly linked. But this J, which is directly linked to I, is also given by B star. And what I call the shift is just the, the tensor product of an invertible. The sockle the sock K, the sockle of A, is invertible in the Gornstein case. Uh, just one word about the proof. C star is always this hum C A star. So somehow it's, we can dualize the sequence from A, I into A into B in two different ways. Take this hum with the second module A and take this hum with the second module A star. And the letter is exact as this is just taking dual. So uh, the difference between them is just the following as A um, uh, is L tensor of K with A star and L is invertible. You can take the letter and tensor with L and you get the first. And you get in particular that alpha is surjective in and that two holds. And in fact, one can be seen by double dualizing. Anyway, this is just a flavor of the proof. <clears throat> I will say a little about the geometry. <clears throat> Fix a Notarian base scheme S and a finitely generated graded quasi coherent of, of S algebra A. In this way, given an S scheme, let as usual A T be the pullback of A. And again, M, the category of now quasi coherent A slash T mod A sub T modules. For V, Define the dual in this way. And now generalize all previous things I've said and more in the standard way. We get categories F, G, and their full subcategories of Artinian over A, T. And let B, H be functions with A finite and S the supremum. One more thing before we have the next theorem, fix a graded locally finitely generated A module B with graded pieces BP locally free of rank BP. Then generalizing the above yields the graded dual novus S chief. And uh, we have the following sets of subsheaves. 
Again, it's a C with F and H in front, and now the lower index is the sheaf, and it's graded dual. And the theorem is that let L be the sum and X the spec of this quasi coherent sheep. Denote by O of X, denote the O of X module as associated to B by B tilde and set Q equal this quad scheme. Then there, then the sets above for functors which are representable by possibly empty subschemes of Q, call it double F or just F, C slash B, H slash B, and correspondingly for the dual. And my call it duality give canonical isomorphism. Well, I can't say anything much about the proof now, but it's still, it's very close and essential that we use the flattening stratification to um, a Q, which is deduced from the universal quotient of P tilde. I think I have to let it be there, but um, the functors are representable by these arguments. Then it's the last construction I am able to take today. It's, um, it's uh, let T B H of S and G, the Grossmannian of rank T locally free portions of S. Let U be the universal quotient of Bs uh, uh, on G. So U star, the dual, is contained in B dagger in this way. Form the natural map for any P greater or equal to minus S. Note that <laughs> if you think a little bit of what's going on, uh, if you take the case t equal one, this map is just the these maps for various p is just the catalecticans matrices or more patient catalecticans we need to consider to get the forms to have the desired Hilbert function, and so we should take the scheme LP, the subscheme of the Grassmannian, where the rank is H star. That is an S map factor through LF, if and only if the co-kernel of the pullback of um, mu P to T is locally free of this rank. LX LP exists by flattening its certification, and we take HL of H slash B to be this intersection. Then locally LP is defined by the vanishing of its minors of size H star P plus one, and the non-vanishing of those of size H star of P. I am on my la last slide now, so given a uh, scheme point G, let K be the residue field. Then the G element of this HL is element of this HL if and only if the map mu P tensor with K has rank H star of P for P greater or equal to S. Thus, as P varies, the HL stratified G. So again, it is this stratification already on the 
slide before, which is used to find that this scheme exists, and in addition, it represents the function. So there is indeed a canonical isomorphism of schemes between this H lambda of small h with this level scheme H of L upper H. Um, so this takes care of the first part, which in fact overlapped a little bit in mine, now it's done properly. Um, the above results with field proofs appeared in fact two, more than two years ago. And in, at that time, our preprint was on 27 pages. And there is much more to say about this. The current version I have is 54 pages. Four pages. So, but I can't say more today. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, Steve, for your large contribution in all the results above. As said, is I have learned a lot, and it has been very nice to work with you. Thanks for listening. Good. Well, thank you for uh, for your talk. Yeah, it was so nice to think through some highlights uh, the last two weeks and try to put it down in this way. My first version of this uh, talk was much longer than these 20 minutes, but I guess I took a little more thing. Okay, then I am ready. Any more questions or observations? So we should uh, think again. Uh, a nice talk. Yeah. So our next speaker is Anna Maria Castravet from Université Paris-Saclay in Versailles. And her title is, if I'm correct, Blown Up Toric Surfaces with Non-Polyhedral Effective Cone. Please, Anna Maria, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, it's very nice to see you, Steve. Um, happy birthday. Thank uh, you. I should say yeah, that uh, these five years I spent at MIT uh, were I think the, the most uh, formative and the most important probably of my life and uh, you were a big part of it. Um, I remember fondly all those weekly meetings in your office. I actually wish now I would have something like that with somebody holding me to a higher standard. In any case, yeah, thank you so much for all your support. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, wonderful family. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah, and so yeah, yeah, yeah you're you're yeah. you're unchanged also. Yes, so that's um, okay. So I want to tell you something about uh, effective cones of uh, divisors on uh, surfaces, but also on uh, other varieties. So this is a joint work with uh, Antonio Laface, Genia Tevelev, and Luca Ugalia. Um, so it, although the the main result is is a result about surfaces. Uh, it will it will have an application to uh, to other varieties, uh, namely modelized spaces of uh, stable rational curves. So I want I will start with this application. Um, sorry, uh, yeah. So I will uh, look at the modelized spaces of stable rational curves with markings. Um, so I will call M zero and the the configuration space of M distinct uh, ordered points on P one taken up to automorphisms. So if we if n is three, uh, we can uh, fix uh, the three points up to PGL two as zero one in infinity, and this is just a, this configuration space is just a point. Uh, in general, yes, for 
uh, all n, uh, you can uh, always do the same thing. And if you fix three of the points as zero and infinity, then you're left just with the choice of uh, n minus three more points um, distinct from each other and distinct from zero, one, and infinity. So for n equal four, this is just p1 without uh, three points. And you can, of course, compactify this um, to p1. And more generally, we have the delhi manfred knudsen comp compactification which is a, um, a smooth projective variety, which uh, represents this uh, model life functor of stable rational curves. Uh, so what we added to the configuration space uh, is uh, uh, the so-called boundary divisors, where a, a general point will parameterize a curve with, uh, with two components. And so corresponding to a partition of the set of uh, N markings. So here it's a picture for equal five, we have 10 boundary divisors. Uh, these may, of course, intersect, and these will correspond to uh, curves with more components, and so to higher co-dimensional strata in the model A space. And so I'll, I'll be interested here in the birational geometry of this space. And uh, I should say that uh, some of the uh, one question that generated a lot of research into, uh, uh, into uh, looking into this birational geometry of M0 and bar is uh, the more general question of uh, if you can describe uh, ample divisors on MG bar, so the modelized space of stable genus G curves. And uh, as it, so there, the, there is this open question whether every curve is uh, numerically equivalent to a sum of uh, one dimensional strata, or the strata are defined similarly uh, in terms of imposing nodes on the curves. So that question, uh, if it's true, it would give uh, via uh, Kleiman theorem, uh, it will give a characterization, a combinatorial characterization of ample divisors on MG bar. And now that question is uh, by a result of Gibney, Keel, and Morris, and is equivalent to the same question for M0 M bar. So we are asking, is every curve on M0 M bar numerically equivalent to a sum of one dimensional strata? So uh, that's not what uh, this talk will be about. And so instead of looking at curves, uh, which seems for the moment to be still too hard, we're gonna look at divisors. So we're gonna try to say something about divisors on, uh, on this space. And, uh, so let me just say a few more words about why this question is, is hard. Uh, yeah, so there is a, so in genus zero, uh, there is um, an explicit description of the model I space due to Kapranov. So the model I space actually is isomorphic to an iterated blow up of a projective space, uh, dimension n minus three. Yeah, so you start with n minus one uh, points in linearly general position. Uh, you blow them up. Then you take uh, proper transforms of all the two, of all the lines spanned by any two of the points. You blow them up and you do the same with the plane spanned by any three of the points and so on. All the linear, you blow up all the linear subspaces spanned by, uh, by these n minus one points. Uh, and this description is, uh, as you see, there is a there is an asymmetry. There is a n description like this, uh, one for every choice of a marking. Um, okay, and so for example, for n equal five, yes, this describes M zero five bar as a blow up of P two at four points. It's a del pezzo surface at degree five. So fan of surface, the anti-canonical line bundle example. Um, and then uh, for n equals six, uh, you can also prove that uh, M06 bar is the blow up of the segre cubic uh, at, at its 10 nodes. So here, this is not a uh, Fano threefold anymore, uh, but it's close. The anti-canonical is big and F. And then you lose this property, I'm sorry, you lose this property of uh, positivity in the anti-canonical as, a, for example, for n at least eight, the anti-canonical has no multiple which has sections. So uh, this is all to say that you have uh, this kind of concrete space, it's a rational variety, but it's uh, getting further and further away from being uh, Fano. And so uh, we know uh, uh, little about its birational geometry. And so, as I said, I, I would be interested in effective cones of divisors. So I'm gonna look at uh, numerical classes of, uh, of, of divisors. I'm gonna take, uh, look, I'm gonna look at effective divisors, take the cones spanned by, by them uh, and take, the, take its closure. This is what I'll call the, call the effective cone. And so you can also ask there uh, the same question, is, uh, is it true that every device, every effective divisor is a sum of uh, boundary divisors? So it's the same question as I mentioned before for curves, uh, this time for divisors. 
Um, and what is, uh, you, you can, uh, yeah, so we're looking at what I call the effective cone, really the, the pseudo effective cone, yes, the closure of the cones done by effective divisors. Uh, every boundary divisor will generate an extreme array of this cone. This is because um, you can actually realize every boundary divisor as, a, as an exceptional divisor or divisor that's contracted by one of these blow up, uh, blow down maps of Caprano, which describe uh, M0 bar as an iterated blow up. So we know these are, uh, uh, yes, they are, ex they span extreme arrays of this cone. And then the question that I mentioned is, are these generating the entire cone? Yes, is there a question? Uh, okay, so for n equal five, uh, this is true. Yes, uh, the, the 10 boundary divisors can be contracted by a blowdown map to P2. Yes, so it, they are minus one curves. There are exactly 10 boundary divisors and 10 minus one curves. They are exactly the same. So this is a del pezzo surface. And uh, so the minus one curves will generate the uh, effective cone. But as, um, as n grows uh, already at n equals six, uh, it is not true anymore that the boundary divisors generate the effective cone. So for n equals six, uh, this is uh, close to being true. Uh, modulo, uh, a new type of divisor, which uh, was discovered by Kiel and Vermeer. So these are some, there is only one, one divisor up to the S6 uh, symmetry, but these are not boundary divisors and they do span extreme arrays. So we still have a finitely generated cone, except that now the extreme arrays uh, include also a different type of divisor. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so for the history of this question, uh, I just want to mention that uh, these Kilvermeer divisors can be generalized for all n. Uh, with Genia Tevelev, we introduced a combinatorial gadget, which we call the hypertree. And for every n, there is many hypertrees, a finite number, but, but the numbers grow with n. And for each hypertree, there is an associated uh, divisor, effective divisor, which spans an extreme array of the effective cone. At some point, we thought this was everything. Uh, as it turns out, that was not true. For n bigger equal than seven, there are other types of extreme arrays. Uh, again, a finite number, but, uh, but a different type. So then, um, yeah, this is results of uh, OP and uh, Doran Jan Siracusa Jensen. And so this uh, complexity is then uh, now explained by, uh, by this theorem uh, with uh, Antonio, Eugenia, and Luca, that uh, in fact, this, this effective cone is uh, not, a not finitely generated, so not polyhedral if n is at least 10. And this is true in uh, both in characteristic zero and in characteristic p. Uh, so the, there is a gap here for uh, seven, eight, and nine. We do not know uh, what happens. And in so, um, um, okay. Uh, so a consequence of this is that uh, M0 bar is not a so-called modular space in the same range. So this is, a, as the name suggests, it's a, uh, it's a notion that the, the Morris program works, uh, works in an ideal fashion. Uh, and a prime example of modular space uh, is uh, our, our toric varieties. So in a way, uh, the stratification of M0 M bar into these strata uh, of configuration spaces yeah, was uh, reminiscent of uh, uh, the stratification of toric varieties. Um, so uh, yeah, for a more space, uh, in particular, the effective cone would be polyhedral. Uh, and then, uh, so the main theorem here is actually a consequence, as I said, it's an application of a theorem about surfaces. And the, the, the theorem is that, uh, in fact, for every characteristic, there exist projective toric surfaces where when you blow up one point, the identity point of the open torus, um, in other words, a general point uh, on this surface, so just one point, uh, then the effective cone becomes uh, not finitely generated. Um, okay. So in, yeah, so this, uh, this is a, uh, yeah, when, when you do P2, for example, yeah, you need to get to nine points to get uh, nine general points to get to a non polyhedral effective cone. Here, if you choose your toric surface uh, carefully, already one point uh, is enough to go from, yeah, from a space where you understand everything about the birational geometry and to one where uh, um, just this uh, effective cone is already, uh, is already complicated. Um, okay, and so. 
So uh, to reduce from the higher dimensional case to the case of surfaces, uh, we use a, what we call a rational contraction. So this is, uh, we look at the, uh, a rational map between uh, two factorial normal projective varieties. And uh, we want the rational map to be a composition of several uh, either small modifications, so isomorphisms in co-dimension one or surjective morphism. And there could be several of them. Uh, uh, so the having a rational contraction will uh, will uh, preserve certain properties, such as uh, um, yeah, so the property of being a modulum space or having a rational polyhedral effective cone. So if X has one of these properties, then the target Y of our rational contraction will do uh, also. Yeah, so this is a for small modifications, uh, the result is uh, essentially immediate. Um, for surjective morphisms, uh, it's a consequence of uh, work of uh, Okawa and uh, Buxong de Maipo on Peternel. Uh, so for this part, uh, so we're, we're using the duality between the effective cone of divisors and the cone of movable curves. So we are not, uh, yeah, so to prove that, uh, that the, the cone is, uh, the effective cone of uh, M0 bar is not, uh, is, not, is not polyhedral, we will construct a rational contraction towards uh, a surface which has a non-polyhedral effective cone. Uh, so it's not going to be an explicit uh, way of giving uh, infinitely many extreme arrays of the cone, but rather showing that the, the image of this cone is not, is not polyhedral. Um, okay, and so uh, an, a result uh, uh, that we use here is also the, um, an older result with Genia uh, that, that M0 M bar can be squeezed in between uh, using rational contractions between uh, blow ups of a certain toric variety, the loss of, mo loss of money model I space. And uh, so it's the same type of uh, space where you take a, a toric variety and you blow up the identity point. So as, uh, as I say here, this is an actual model I space. It will, uh, it has a model I uh, space interpretation. Uh, it still com compactifies the configuration space. Instead of just using uh, trees of P1s, we're using chains of P1s. Another way to describe it is also explicitly uh, similar to the Caprano description we gave for M0 and bar. It's exactly the same iterated type of uh, blow up, except you blow up one less point. And so you start with Pn minus three and you blow up N minus two points and then all the lines and planes and all the linear subspaces spent by them. And so you can see from here also that this is a toric, uh, a toric variety. The N minus two points can be fixed to be the uh, torus invariant points of the projective space. Um, and uh, in this space, uh, so this particular toric variety and its blow up at the identity are uh, in some sense universal among uh, toric varieties and their blow ups at the identity point. In this sense that uh, if you take any projective uh, Q factorial toric variety, you can find uh, an, an N sufficiently large such that uh, you have rational contractions from, uh, from the loss of money space to, to the toric variety and similarly between the blow ups at the identity points. Um, okay, and so, uh, uh, so yeah, so then uh, the theorem I mentioned about surfaces is, uh, um, is now how to construct uh, projective toric surfaces where, for which the blow up at the identity point is, is not, um, has a defective cone which is not polyhedral. So here the idea is that yeah, lattice polygons uh, in the plane, yes, will correspond to uh, projective toric surfaces. And then something we call a good polygon will correspond to uh, what we call an elliptic pair. This is just uh, terminology for now. Uh, and then uh, there will be two types of polygons, uh, some uh, which we call lang trotter polygons corresponding to elliptic pairs of infinite order. Uh, so this will be useful uh, in characteristic zero. This will always, uh, give an effective cone uh, of this type of surface, which is not polyhedral in characteristic zero. Uh, and then sometimes also the same is true in characteristic P. And then the other types, uh, half on polygons corresponding to elliptic pairs of finite order, this will be um, 
uh, we'll have a non poly we'll correspond to non poly effective cones in all but finitely many characteristics. Um, I should say yeah, that this, uh, so when you take a toric surface uh, like this, yeah, this will be defined over the integers. And so this surface here, when you blow up the, the identities, also defined over the integers. So we can once, so it makes sense to uh, talk about um, the reduction modulo p and what happens with the effective cone when you reduce modulo p. Uh, okay, and so here is a picture of a long throttle polygon. And uh, th this polygon is the one that uh, allows one to prove that, uh, that M0 10 bar is not, uh, does not have a finitely generated effective cone because it, it has a contraction, a rational contraction to, to uh, one of these uh, toric surfaces, to the blow up of the toric surface. So uh, the key point here is that, uh, that when you take the, the fan of the loss of money space, of dimension seven, there is a way to project to the plane and obtain this uh, grid of uh, black points. And the grid that contains uh, these red points, which correspond to the fan of the, the historic surface. And the fact that one is a subset of the other is what allows one to construct, uh, to construct this rational contraction between the uh, blow up of the loss of money space and, and this surface. Uh, and so let me just, uh, since yeah, I'm almost out of time, I just want to show you the, so what an elliptic pair is, uh, is, um, is the pair of a rational surface together with an elliptic curve, which has a self intersection zero on the surface. We can work with uh, even with singular surfaces and singular curves, as long as the curve is disjoint from the singularities. Uh, an example is, uh, so in some sense, we're saying we're, we're looking at surfaces, which are blow-ups of the historic surfaces at one point, which are, but are, are somewhat similar to what happens to the case of P2 blown up at nine, nine general points. And, uh, so this is an example, you can see the cubic through the points. Uh, this will give you an elliptic pair. Uh, and so the, then the idea is, uh, so I won't, uh, I will stop here, but the idea is then how to, um, what conditions you want to impose on the polygon, on our lattice polygon, so that uh, when you blow up, when you consider the corresponding toric surface and you blow up the identity point, we want to be in the setup. We want to have a, an elliptic curve with self-intersection zero. And this is, uh, this is what, uh, what we achieve and this is what, uh, what makes this work. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you. And happy birthday again. And thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> we could allow for uh, one question, maybe. Is there any question? Maybe I have a very, um, very naive question is, um, so we usually when we write the pairs, we write first the variety and then the divisor. Is there a reason for you writing the other way around? <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're satisfied with the answer, Carolina? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Ana Maria. <laughs> Okay, then we'll thank Anna Maria again. And then we're going to move on to the next uh, talk. And the next talk is by Eduardo Esteve at IMPA. So our host institution for this event. And his title is a fine relative compactified Jacobian. At least the title that was in the program. So can you share your screen, please? Yes, uh, Ragnia. I'll just uh, say a few words before. Okay. Uh, so I want to mention that we have had uh, uh, more than 150 people registering for the event. <laughs> right? People come and go because it's a long time. It's three continents. So, <laughs> but it's, it's a large number of people. And it's a measure of how influential and accessible Steve has always been. In fact, uh, 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 I remember uh, in the early 90s when I was a doctoral student at MIT, that uh, back then most, most professors would keep their doors closed 
but Steve's door was always open. <laughs> and uh, I would look at it uh, uh, from the end of the corridor and thought, wow, I'll have my time to talk to him. But as I got there, there was always somebody inside. <laughs> <laughs> I had my fair time. I could speak a lot to, to Steve, more than my fair time. So that was okay. But it's really a measure of how accessible he is. And he has made many friends out of doctor students, postdocs, collaborators, and people that would just drop by. So <laughs> it, it was a very good time. And uh, okay, so uh, the title of uh, uh, the talk, it's, it's exactly what uh, uh, Raggi said. And uh, I could say that it was also the title of my uh, project thesis proposed by Steve in my first year there. So I'm running a bit late, Steve, but I'm all, almost there. <laughs> so uh, in fact, this is uh, the, the first paper by Steve that uh, I read, <laughs> like find the Picard scheme. It's actually a hard copy from back then. This is uh, I have a lot of scribbled a lot of things there, but it was the first paper that I read by Steve. So we actually quote this paper twice, but let me start now by presenting my screen. Okay, so let's see. Let's see how do I do that. Okay, I want to do the whole desktop. I think that will work. Just a moment. Okay, so are you seeing my, my screen shared? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So let me uh, uh, increase this. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's the title, the fine relative compact by Jacobians. It's been a joint work. Uh, it's, it's, it's a long work but with uh, Omid Amini from the Code Politique in Africa. So let me give you the definitions. Uh, we start with a curve. And by a curve, I just mean something which is projected and reduced of pure dimension one, unconnected. Uh, we want to compactify the Jacobian, we want to compactify line bundles. So there's several ways of doing that, uh, but one way that was suggested by Meyer and Mumford, it's this. Uh, if you have a coherent sheet on X, there are several definitions. It is simple if its endomorphisms are the trivial ones, just multiplication by scalars. It's called torsion free rank one. If it, you can write it as a tensor product of an invertible sheaf and a sheaf of ideals of a finite subscheme, a natural object to consider. And it has degree D, but it's a numerical thing. The difference of these Euler characteristics is D. Okay. So uh, under the conditions on the curve, an invertible sheet is simple, torsion free, rank one. So the idea is to use these uh, different objects to compactify the Picard scheme or the Jacobian in this situation. And I start with a, a theorem by Altman and Kleiman, and there is a small contribution by myself. And the theorem is this, that there is a fine moduli scheme that parameterizes simple torsion free rank one degree D sheets. Yeah. And my contribution is the last sentence. It's universally closed, uh, locally of finite types still already. Okay, so it's universally closed. It's kind of remarkable because uh, the simpleness is an open condition, but uh, that happens because uh, this scheme is not separated. So, at least it's universally closed. That means that limits exist, uh, but there are infinitely many of them. So uh, uh, let me point to the part of uh, the paper where it disappeared. So let's see if I can, uh, I can uh, oh, this work better. Okay, just a moment. I don't know what this means. I forget it. Okay, so that's uh, the paper by Steve. And uh, it's, uh, let me go back to, present the statement, it's on page 99. Yeah, it's, it's right there. So if you have a locally projected, uh, finally presented morphism of schemes, then the tau associated sheet of the simple sheets is represented by a quasi separated algebraic space locally finally presented over S. 
right? in the case of a single curve, it's actually a scheme, not just an algebraic space. But that's it. That's uh, the statement here. I don't know about this, but uh, let me go back to my presentation. All right. So it's there in the first paper that I read by Steve. We have this statement. Okay, it's universally closed. There are many limits. That's the problem, right? And it's not even a finite type. Uh, it's just too much, right? So the idea would be to restrict uh, the kind of objects that uh, we consider. So that was basically the suggestion given by Odin Seshadri. It was a combinatorial uh, uh, way. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can make this. Just a moment. Okay. And uh, the idea is to use a polarization. So if you look, if you call V the set of irreducible components of X, a degree D polarization is just a, 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 a choice of a rational number for each component of X, such that the sum of these rational numbers is the degree. So that's a sort of a choice of a multi-degree, a rational multi-degree for a line bundle on the curve. And then there is the notion of stability or semi-stability. We say that uh, Toshofirian Kondschiff is Q semi-stable if we have this inequality, which means that the multi-degree of my sheet is not very far from the chosen rational multi-degree. And you have a strict inequality for stability. And these are uh, uh, the numbers that, is, that appear in the formula. So this delta i is the number of points counted with multiplicities between the subcurve and the complement, right? So the condition must be checked on every proper subcurve. Q of i is just the sum of these rational numbers for the components inside y. And i y is the restriction, motion of i to the subcurve, which is just the restriction of the line bundle and of the uh, uh, points, okay? And the theorem is that uh, there is actually an open subscheme that parameterizes the stable or the semi stable and simple uh, sheets. Uh, the first one is separated, and the second one is universally closed and of finite type. So, so you get a good compactification when uh, Q is such that uh, both subschemes coincide when stability is equal to semi stability. And we call such a polarization non-degenerate. So that's a good thing, but we want to do a relative situation. And then, I mean, how do we choose these polarizations in a family? Right? They, they must be compatible in such a way that we can put these spaces together. Okay. Now, this can be achieved in a number of ways. I uh, will take my approach from a, a recent presentation by Cass, Jesse Cass and Nicola Pagani, how to do this in families. So the idea is, is, is very simple. If you have a family of curves for each point, you look at VS, the set of irreducible components of a geometric fiber, right? You need to allow a base extension so that you get all the irreducible components there are. Okay? But once you do that, uh, there is a bijection. It doesn't depend on the geometric fiber on the particular one that you choose. Now, if you have a specialization, so if I have a, a, a eta specializing to S on my base S, right? There is a natural surjection. I can look at uh, the an irreducible component of the special fiber and uh, view it in the closure of an irreducible component of the generic fiber. You have to do some base extensions for this to work, but that's that's how it's done, and uh, that's the assignment, right? So that reducible component has y in its boundary, right? It could have more components on its boundary, but that induces a, a contraction map uh, between polarizations on the special fiber and polarizations on the generic fiber. So you take a polarization Q and you get a polarization that assigns to each irreducible component the sum of Q of i for all y that lies in the boundary of Z. Okay. So that's called a contraction map. And we say that C of Q is the contraction of Q under the specialization. Right? 
So to be able to, to have this property of contraction is what you need to, to actually make it work in practice. Okay? So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, degree D polarization assignment is the assignment of a polarization for every fiber, right? such that uh, we're gonna keep the degree D. And uh, we require that if eta specializes to S, then Q of eta is the contraction of Q of X. So if you can have this assignment for this family, then uh, it's, it's a good thing. You can construct the relative uh, uh, compactifications of the Jacobian. We, we're gonna see this. But first let's look at an example, right? To see that uh, how this works in a sense. We can consider the family of conics, y over t. So t is the base, it's just a one. And y is this union of two lines. And you see that I put it that way, such that the first line converges to uh, y equals to zero if t goes to zero, and the second to x equals to zero. Whereas if t goes to one, the opposite happens. Okay. Now this uh, family of conics is actually a base change of another family, which is this one. So you can make the product, you can work out what it's necessary. And you see that the first is obtained from the second by a base change of degree two. Okay? So S is a disgressional function, degree two upstairs, downstairs, right? And uh, so, so this Y of T is, is a base extension of a family whose general fiber is irreducible, but it's not geometrically irreducible because it decomposes after base extension. Right? And then it's impossible because of that to obtain a polarization assignment for X over S where Q0 is not symmetric. Right? If you are on Y over T, okay, you can find something, but on this X over S family, it's, it's actually possible. So Q0 has to be symmetric, meaning that uh, the, the degree, the, the value assigned to, to each of the two lines must be the same. And, and that imposes a lot of restriction. In fact, uh, it's uh, a statement by Cass and Pagani that there are actually very few polarization assignments. If you take the universal family of stable curves, well, none of the curves in this example are stable, but you can see how to generalize this, this thing that there are very few polarization assignments. It, they must be symmetric. Uh, they must uh, basically rely on the multi-degree of the canonical shift. Uh, there is very little you can do with that. And on the other hand, there are few polarization assignments. Once you have a, one of them, you can, choose, you can choose a shift, an object that you want to consider, but then uh, it's not a good thing. Because uh, in their work on limit linear series, Isenberg and Harris observed that a single limit line bundle cannot describe the full data arising in the generation. Mm -hmm. So you have the canonical bundle, it degenerates to the canonical bundle or the dualizing sheaf on your stable curve. But if you look at uh, the canonical system, it degenerates to other kinds of devices. If you look at the Weierstrass points, just by looking at the canonical system on this special curve, you cannot describe the limits of those Weierstrass points. Okay, so the thing then to do, the idea is to actually allow our polarization assignment to consist not just of one single polarization, but of a set. So here I'm fixing my definition in red. So it says before, but now uh, degree D polarization assignment is the assignment of a subset of the set of all possible polarizations for each fiber. The degree for every Q must be equal to D. And if eight is specializes to S, then what I ask is that the contraction of Q is in lambda eta for each, for each Q. I actually require also that every polarization on lambda eta is a, a degeneration, but, but yeah, let's, let's keep with that. So instead of looking at a, a, a single polarization for each fiber, I look at a collection of polarizations. And so in this example here, right? So I put the curves in the example here again, then X over S now admits the polarization assignment, uh, which is not symmetric. 
but it is symmetric in the in this in the sense. I mean, the set is symmetric. Okay? But this allows me the flexibility of considering uh, uh, stable limits at the end that uh, uh, have a motor very close to this one. Of course, I'll have to take this as well. Right? Then uh, I could consider several limits, and I have some way to I have in some way to connect them to make uh, into a, a nice uh, uh, a small space, a small compactification of my chapter. Okay. And that's, this is how I do it. That's how it's done. Uh, we pick a curve. We pick its set of reducible components. And I pick a lambda polarization assignment. Here I'm dealing with a single curve. So it's just a set of uh, polarizations. And then we define a, an intertwining of simple torsion derangement sheets on X with that polarization assignment as a collection of uh, sheets and classes of maps relating these sheets. So every two sheets I have, must have a non-zero map and I'm interested in the class of this non-zero map. Okay. So the condition is that uh, uh, for every polarization, there must be a sheet which is stable with respect to that. And for every sheet, there is a polarization which is stable with respect to that. Now, if I have two sheaves that are stable with respect to the same polarization, since there is a non-zero map between them, they're isomorphic. So basically I'm picking a stable sheaf for every uh, Q in the polarization. <laughs> and these maps have to satisfy some compatibility, which is a closed condition, which says that if I do a composition of them, right, the composition must be a multiple of the direct map. So it's exactly this. So I, I say it's almost commutative because the composition could be zero, right? And it satisfies this equation. And the theorem is that there is a fine model A scheme parameterizing these the points. Now, uh, before showing this, I'll actually, uh, we have to do more and uh, I'll explain now. And I'll show a, a different statement rather than this one. So what happens is that if you're interested in considering the generations of line models on uh, the generic family of curves, you have to, to realize that there's something else that's generating, which is the structure sheet itself, the trivial line bundle degenerates, and not just to the trivial line bundle, to many line bundles. Okay? So along your family, you also have the degeneration of your uh, structure sheet. If you have a line bundle degeneration, you have the degeneration of that line bundle. And you have the degeneration of the trivial bilinear map, which is OX tensor the line bundle to L. Right? So you have this, this trivial isomorphism, which is this bilinear map, right? That degenerates as well. Right? So that's that's the, the idea there, that we want to look at the generations of these bilinear maps as well. I won't do here because I don't have much time, all possible degrees, I'll concentrate in degree zero. So I pick a polarization assignment on my curve of degree zero, and I'll look at the degeneration now of the structure sheet. And the idea is that the degeneration of that is an energy structure. So what's an energy structure? That's a term that was coined by Lila Maino in uh, the early 90s, maybe. And uh, uh, I'm generalizing this. Okay. So what's this? It's, it's basically an intertwining, but not so much. I pick a collection of, of sheets, torsion free rank one sheets, and a collection of bilinear maps, non zero <laughs> bilinear maps or classes of them. So, this is the projectivized space associated to the home of tensor product of two of them to another one. Okay. So, here I'm looking at the degeneration of the trivial map, OX, tensor OX going to OX. Okay, and uh, the condition is, is basically the same one and two that uh, I mean, um, there is a, a Q stable sheet for every Q and basically only one. And there is a compatibility condition, which you can think of as an associative condition. That is, uh, if you put, uh, you have these six indices there and you put all the maps there and you, you make one, then make the other, this must almost commute. So it's again a closed And the, the theorem, uh, oh yes, uh, uh, there's uh, first of all, 
a proposition to, to, to tell you that these conditions are actually enough in a sense. So if lambda is appropriate, which means symmetric and convex, think of it as large enough set of polarizations. Then there is the structure sheet is part of these LJs. And for every given LJ, the inverse is there as well. The dual is there as well. Okay. The dual as a torsion free rank function. All right, so the theorem by uh, Amini and myself, I'm going to give a proof of that. It's very simple, but it's, it's worth doing. If lambda is appropriate, then there is a fine modelized scheme parameterizing enriched structures. I, I said that it's universally closed, but it's actually proper. It's separated as well if lambda is a set of non degenerate polarizations. Uh, so that's nice. But that's not so difficult. The difficult part is actually work in progress. So what I'm doing with uh, Omid, Amini, is uh, to consider the case where my curve is nodal and uh, lambda is appropriate. Then uh, there are these two remarkable statements. First of all, my data relies on the choice of these bilinear maps. And if I look at each uh, three sheets, there might be more than just one bilinear map. But if you look at all of them with the conditions imposed, the set is unique. The classes are unique. So I'm really parameterizing shifts. And uh, every structure is actually the degeneration of uh, the structure shift along a certain smoothing of my curve. So I'm not adding anything new here, anything not necessary. Okay. That's work in progress. Uh, we have many reasons to believe that it's well advanced, but I don't want to speak about that because I don't have much time. I want to speak about the theory, right? So how do we parameterize this data? Oh, it's not so difficult actually. Right? So what you do is you pick all your polarizations in lambda, it's a fine set. Uh, we look at uh, the universal sheets that arise from, uh, everything is fine right here, it's, it's a universal. So I have the universal sheet parameterizing all these things. And the idea is that uh, now I have to look at the maps, right? The bilinear maps, use these sheets to construct the bilinear maps, right? And uh, what helps us is that uh, there is a, a, a thing that represents this. So there is a coherent sheet, this H, which lies on this product here, which represents this covariant functor the covariant functor of, of maps, of bilinear maps from three sheets to uh, this, this tensor product to this other sheet here, right? Uh, so once we uh, have- Sorry, that, sorry, Eduardo, sorry, but I think you have to wrap up. Right, wrap I'm up. going to wrap, wrap up right now because <laughs> once you have that the sheet, it's, it's clear what you do, right? You just take the product of all uh, the projectivized spaces over the sheets. But why do we have those sheets? Right? If you look at what you want to do, okay, this shift here, L, is simple, is, is flat over the base. It's a universal family. But the tensor product is not. So do these shifts exist? Well, we go back to the first paper of Steve that I read. It's uh, right here. And they go to one of the first statements of the paper, section two. You know, Steve not only motivated us, but he gave the tools for us to work on our motivation. And uh, if you look at uh, the statement here, oh, it's in the, the, yes, right here, the module H. So if you have a finite represented proper morphism and you have two sheets which are locally finite presented with flat over S, then there exists a locally finite presented OS module that, uh, okay, represents the covariant functor. And you look at here, just F needs to be flat. Oh, that's wonderful. That's exactly what I need. So who would go to the trouble of uh, stating exactly what he proves without any additional unnecessary conditions? Thank you, Steve. <laughs> It's wonderful to see it working. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, does anybody have a quick question before we move on? 
I have a, a stupid quick, 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 stupid short question. Okay. Uh, so what are the, the group structure, right? So uh, presumably, I mean, we know the Picard is a group scheme uh, and the Jacobian, uh, I, I assume the compactified thing isn't a group, otherwise you'd have told us that. Uh, oh. Right, but, but it is, it has some dense open subscheme, which is a group. And I'm wondering, uh, does the boundary stuff connect different components or how does it move around by the group structure? Right, so, so there is an action of uh, this open subset, which has the group structure on the whole thing, right? So yeah. there is an action there. And it's, it's a very interesting action in a sense because uh, uh, I haven't talked about that yet, but it's part of the question that uh, Steve posed to you. <laughs> uh, by mail recently, that uh, <laughs> if you look at the, at the, the ABO map, right? You have the ABO map, right? If you- I, if I have what, FGA, FGA open with- uh, Right, right. right. Yes. Yes. So, so the, basically, if you have the ABO map, the ABO map is, has some properties over, over the compact by Jacobian. But if you, if you take the product with the Jacobian and consider this, this bi-graded ABO maps, it's smooth. Uh -huh. So that tells you that the boundary has some connection with, with the, the, the open set and, and the curve itself. But so, it, it is not connected to your stratification game. Uh, to to uh, the, so not stratification, I mean this uh, um, a polarization game. It's no, no, no. The polarization is a game for us to be able to actually construct compactification, right? So if you want to, to just compactify it and, uh, in a nice way, then you can use a polarization. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we are doing with OMID, in a sense, is, is forgetting the polarization. And look, we're looking at all limits and uh, how they fit together, mm -hmm. right? So this, this idea of uh, just considering a, a polarization set, we're gonna actually going to make this set grow and grow and grow. And we're going to consider the limit, the formal limit, the inverse limit of all these compactifications. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thanks to Eduardo again. And then, if you can stop right. screen sharing, then uh, our next speaker is Abramo Hefes from University. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> And his title, can't you, can't you, yeah, good. And the title of Abramo's talk is The Influence of Steve Kleiman on My Mathematical Work. Please, Abramo. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And like the lovely talks we are, we are having, we're having till now, I will share some personal memories of the time I was Steve's student rather than going into technical mathematics. So there is no screen to share. I was introduced to Steve Kleiman by my old friend, Israel Weinschenker. And this happened in the summer of 1981 during a conference held in the magnificent Villa Monastero on the Como Lake sponsored by CNR, the Italian Research Council. At that time, I was studying in Florence and had the luck of having recently read Joe Harris' paper, Galois Groups of Enumerative Problems. So we found immediately a common mathematical subject to talk about. I learned later that Steve had a great influence on this work done when Joe was a postdoc at MIT. The communication with Steve flowed so well that he invited me to join MIT as his PhD student. And I suspect that Israel has much to do with this. I accepted instantly his offer and joined MIT by the fall of 1981. I recall my enchantment when walking through MIT corridors, seeing the names of many of my, my mathematical idols on the doors of their offices. During the 81-82 academic year, I took several courses, among them the flawless lessons 
by Steve and by a very cold winter prepared with Giorgio Ferraresi, an Italian other Steve student, my qualifying exams. Steve always gave us a friendly warm support. We used to go on Friday evenings after the algebraic geometry seminar to dinner in a Chinese restaurant when sometimes Mike Artin joined us. Very often we were also invited to lunchtime, at lunchtime to eat our sandwiches at Steve's office where he offered us tea. There were very special moments to socialize and feel sheltered. Eventually when Steve had Italian visitors, he invited us to join them for dessert at his home in Arlington where we were warmly received by him and Beverly. From the beginning, Steve warned me that he intended to spend the academic year 82-83 at the University of Copenhagen. And I had to choose among passing my exams and following or to find a Abramo, your voice. Abramo, yeah. your, your phone. You muted your phone. <laughs> you muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, from the beginning, Steve warned me that he intended to spend the academic year 82 83 at the University of Copenhagen and I had to choose among passing my exams and follow him or to find another advisor. Of course, I chose the first possibility and started to look for my thesis subject. Steve generously, as always, gave me access to his mathematical files where I found among other preciousness an intensive correspondence between him and Graham Higman about the Galois group of Weinschenker's 51 conics in characteristic two. Higman very, was very puzzled by how the 3,264 conics in any other characteristic degenerate to these 51 in characteristic two. And the effect of this degeneration on the associated Galois group. As far as I know, this project remained inconclusive. I also found a letter from Sir to Steve, where among other subjects, he claimed that there should be a consistent theory of duality in positive characteristic in contrast of the, uh, to the belief of Pierre Samuel, who saw only pathologies. Thereby, my decision, my decision was taken. Kalwa groups and duality in positive characteristic. By the fall of 1982, I landed in Denmark with my wife and were generously sheltered by the climates in their apartment at Newham in Copenhagen until we could find a place to live. The ambience at the Math Institute was very cozy. This was a very proficuous time since I could have almost daily conversations with Steve at the afternoon tea time. It was a unique experience and the chance to learn a lot of math with the master. It was there that I finished the joint paper with Gianni Sacchiero, the Galois group of the tangency problem for plane curves, generalizing Harry's paper and advanced the, the, the research on duality for projective varieties in positive characteristic, the subject of my thesis. Returning back to the USA in the fall of 83, I continued to work on my thesis. And during the summer of 84, I revisited Denmark for a couple of months when I had the ultimate insight to conclude the last part of my work, remaining to polish and write the thesis. 
I did this during the last time of 80, 1984 at Boston. This was my subject of research for the next 15 years. From this little fragment of shared history with Steve, one can foresee the greatness of the human being and the influence that he exercised on his mathematical descendants and collaborators. I have only to thank him for all his support and for our long-standing friendship and wish him a happy and healthy long life. Thank you so much. That was lovely. Happy birthday, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for, oh, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Abramo, for sharing your memories. Are there any comments maybe to, uh, <clears throat> or anybody else who would like to say something? Well, since he mentioned 51, <laughs> I should tell everyone that it's the, it's the name of a good, not so good, but it's a, a, an acceptable cachaça in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> it's called 51. 51, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had some of it. <laughs> you have, Susan, yeah? <laughs> okay, folks, I will stop recording now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When, so when do we, uh, so who's the next chair and when do we meet again? To expect. Oops. <laughs> I'm not going back. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so let's assume that the, the one of the quadrics is smooth, so it's a P1 cross P1, and that the line, let's say it's horizontal, it's a P1 cross a point in the second copy of P1. So the intersection with uh, another quadric is a two to divisor on P1 cross P1. And then you are separating here uh, <clears throat> the line in common. Then we have a residual curve, which is uh, the uh, P set cubic in general. And now the expected residual intersection is four. So Bezu's number eight is diminished by four. So it remains four isolated points of intersection. You could go a slightly more generally. Unfortunately, my screen here has the top covered by a bar. So I'll read it for you. Suppose we take three surfaces which intersect in a scheme Z, which is made of a curve C plus phi isolated points, finitely many isolated points. So I'd like to get relations for the degrees of the three surfaces, these isolated intersections in terms of the numerical invariance of the curve C. So one cheap case, I mean, a case where we can say, we can get a formula is when the, the curve that you impose here is a smooth curve, say of degree D, genus G. The three surfaces give us a session of this vector bundle, which is the direct sum of uh, the, these line bundles, okay, then we, dualize the section and get a so-called so co-section, which has image equal to the ideal of zeros. And we're assuming that it decomposes as a disjoint scheme union. So the ideal of Z by co-maximality is the product of the ideals. We blow up <clears throat> the curve C in P3.
call either exceptional divisor, take pullback of the sex of the section sigma dual. So that's the pullback of the section. It has image an ideal in the structure shift of the blown up P3. And this ideal image is again the product of two ideals, one of which is this invertible ideal, which is the idea of the exceptional divisor. So if we untwist it, we get a surjection from this new bundle to this new ideal, which is thus the ideal of the residual finitely many points of intersection. If you dualize this inclusion, you see that it is the dual cross-section of the section of this, let's say, let's call it the strict transform bundle. So E here is twisted. You, you cancel the exceptional divisor. Now, since we have this isomorphism, the finite part which lies here is isomorphic to the finite part that we find upstairs. So it's can be, it can be computed as the third chain class of this rank tree bundle. You expand, you push down to P3 and you get a formula using for instance Schubert. Here is the Bezus number. And here is the compensation for the curve that you imposed. If you specialize to the case of three quadric surfaces in the line, you retrieve the number four, which was computed using Bezu directly on P1 cross P1. So this was a computation using Schubert. You don't need to bore yourself looking at it. So this can be naturally generalized, <coughs> sorry, to the following situation. You take any projective variety of dimension n and a vector bundle of the same rank as the dimension. We pick a global section of this bundle and assume again that its scheme of zeros decomposes as a disjoint, disjoint union of a proper closed subscheme C and a finite part. And we'd like to give a formula for this residual finite part. So here's the formula. So that's let's say Bezu's number in a sense, and that's the correction for the scheme that was imposed, which I called C. The SI that appear here are the push forward to the ambient X of the Sagre class of dimension I of the closed subscheme C in X. I'll recall what the several classes in a moment. So to show this, you are as before blowing up the subscreen C. You have the capital device, which is the projectization now of the normal cone. As before, the section induces a twisted, a section of the twisted bundle which again vanishes exactly along the finite part. And you can get a formula which is similar to the one we got before. Here is a mistype, it should be a minus here instead of an equal. And to see the formula, just recall Fulton's construction of several classes, which by definition are the push forward of these the self-intersection classes that appear here. <clears throat> what I'd like to discuss now is how often 
the hypotheses that uh, was uh, were stated above are met. So the hypothesis was that the zeros of the section was the composed of a disjoint union of a finite part and some C, which could be well, a positive dim dimensional part. You don't have this theorem. Take any smooth projective variety, a vector bundle of rank equal to the dimension of the base X. Fix an, an ample line bundle. And let's twist E by powers of L so as to get as many sections as we wish. And pick a, what I call a good family of closed subschemes. And I'll explain what good is in a moment. So you twist E, take the projective space of global sections, and then look at those sections such that the scheme of zeros contains some member of this chosen family. So what I'd like to discuss is what's the size, what's the degree, what's the dim dimension of this locus inside the PN of all global sections. Then it can be shown that there is a polynomial formula for this sufficiently large. The dimension is the expected one, expected in terms of uh, a Hilbert polynomial. And the degree is given by a polynomial of degree bounded by n times the dimension of W, but this is not optimal. In all explicit examples that I computed with, this n can be brought down. And for this, the precise statement, I'll, I'll ask you to read the paper. So what does I mean, what is meant by a good family? I'll say a family is good if the general member is positive dimensional and is either a local complete intersection or integral. These are the two cases where I can say something meaningful about this law side. So to start that loss, it's natural to start looking at the correspondence of pairs, a member of the family in a section which vanishes along this C. It's not hard to see that this is a projectivization of an explicit vector bundle of the expected rank. This expected rank is controlled by a Hilbert polynomial. And the point is that the condition that a fixed member lie on the zero scheme of the section is linear on the section. And the number of conditions depends only on this Hilbert polynomial for all D sufficiently large. Now the degree of the image of this projective bundle in PN can be computed as the top dimensional segregate class of this vector bundle, provided this map here, this projection map, is generically injected. And that's the main technical difficulty to say anything meaningful on this subject. But that's where we need goodness assumptions on the family of closed subschemes imposed on the sections of this vector bundle E. Then I can show that this is generically injective for all sufficiently large D when the family is good. I'll give just a very quick outline of the proof. You pick a general point in W. So pick a general member of the family of such schemes. 
and pick a section which is general in the fiber over C. Recall we have a projective bundle here. So C is picked in W. The fiber consists of the section which vanish on C. And I pick a general member in this fiber. Then generic injectivity amounts to showing that C is the unique member of W which is a sub-scheme of the scheme of zeros of this section C. So the philosophy here is this, I mean, I'm imposing C to vanishing on a certain C. I don't want it to vanish elsewhere in the family. Just to give a, a, an example, which is easier to understand. Suppose you take a quartic surface in P3, and it is a conic. You automatically contain another conic, of course. Okay? So that's the, the kind of situation we want to get rid of. We Israel? To... Yes? Three minutes remaining. Yes, that's all I need. So the main argument to show this uh, general, inje general injectivity was the sort of Bertini theorem, which was ingeniously devised by Stephen Kleinman, which is suitable for sections of vector bundles of rank equal to the dimension of the base. So that's the theorem. It's a little technical, I'll just go over quickly. And it's applied to show generic injectivity as stated in this corollary, which will be recorded. And let's, let me just say that the proof that Steve found employs with craftsmanship a limb of series which was mined by him from Manford lecture notes on surfaces, which is this lemma here on page 148. Now let me just recall that craftsmanship is the quality that comes from creating with passion, care and attention to detail. It's a quality that is honed, refined and practiced over the course of a career. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> yes, <Ralph. laughs> oh, thank you. That's my junior granddaughter, Bruna. Uh, <laughs> any no. questions for Israel? <clears throat> Is that picture from your uh, birthday party dinner? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Oh. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, we can proceed to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Israel. I, I think I should stop sharing if I knew how. <laughs> Però, scusate. Maybe Eduardo can stop you sharing. Stop share. I found Oh, ah, there you go. <laughs> Okay, our next speaker is Renato Martins. Renato, maybe you can share your screen. Well, so let's go. Just hold a bit. Um, 
I'm ready. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and share your screen, right now? Okay. Uh, I shared. No, we don't seeing? see it. No, maybe you forgot to push the final button. Oh, so. Uh, which which is the final button? Well, you, <laughs> you select share screen. You select a, a window or a tab to view, and then. I'm so oh. glad I, I was not the only one that got. <laughs> ah, yeah, I see. <laughs> ah, good. Now we see. Good. Some. <laughs> okay, let me introduce you. Our next speaker is Renato Martins. His title is Canonical Models and Linear Series on Integral Curves. I'll warn you when there are three minutes remaining. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's put now. Um, oh, so how I um how I minimize this. Okay. Well, so thank you for the invitation, the organizers. This is a work with Steve. It's sort of a summary. Um, the outline, I'm gonna talk about the canonical model, problems and results, linear series and gonality, and scrolls, problems and results. And then Brunetter varieties, which is a work in progress also with Eduardo which is gonna, gonna be a pretty brief description of the problem. So here is the setup. The only things we know we, we need is, that C is an, an integral and projective curve over an algebraically closed field. G is the arithmetic genus and omega is the dualizing shift. So, how can I take this out? Are you seeing something in the, the canonical mode? Yes. Um, well, no problem. Um, the part one is the, the canonical model. And I will do some recall. Um, C is Gorenstein if omega is invertible. C is hyperliptic if there is a morphism C to P1 of degree two. Um, they may be singular, but necessarily Gorenstein. And then I recall a, a result by Rosenlist. Assume C is Gorenstein, then omega defines a morphism K C to P G minus one, since omega is invertible, there's this morphism. And if C is non hyperliptic, then K is an embedding. Otherwise, if C is hyperliptic, then K is a double covering of the rational normal curve. There are many other authors who prove this, this result in different ways for different, under different motivation. And the first question is problems. What if C is non Gorenstein, which was what uh, Steve and I, we devoted our study to this case. And so take the normalization map and consider um, the morphism K bar C bar to PG minus one induced by the global sections of H zero of omega. So H zero of omega doesn't uh, provide a morphism C to PG minus one, but then you can induce uh, a morphism C bar to PG minus one. So the image of this morphism is the canonical model of C. And Rosenlist proved that um, the normalization map factors through C prime. And essentially this line here, this arrow here is Rosenlich theorem, which is a long theorem, by the way. So, uh, so the questions, a natural question, when is C prime smooth? I mean, when this procedure 
uh, normalize the curve? Well, this is too general. So we answer when it is arithmetically normal. And we did it in a characterization result, which is C prime is arithmetically normal. That means the coordinate ring is normal. C prime is smooth and projectively normal. That means the system of hypersurfaces is complete for any degree. C prime is smooth and linearly normal, which means that the system of hyperplanes is complete. So B trivially implies C. C prime is smooth and extremal. That means a Castel Novo curve. Degree of C prime is G plus G bar, the genus of the normalization minus one. And everything here is about C prime. Now let's see which C has this property. So um, to have an arithmetically normal model, C has just one point and the one singular point and the maximal ideal is the conductor ideal. So we called these curves nearly normal. And they appear in the, uh, in the literature under different names. And well, the part I like the most <laughs> is that C implies B. Uh, actually, we proved something else that linearly normal implies projectively normal. Actually, for any integral C in Pn, we degree smaller than 2n. So this theorem has a sibling if we remove its smoothness. So we have C prime is projectively normal linearly normal, extremal. The degree of C prime is G plus G prime, not G bar anymore. G prime, the genus of C prime minus one. And here is the characterization of the curves who have these canonical models. They have just one non gorenstein point and the dimension of OC hat omega P omega P is one where OC hat is the blow up along Omega. And this is a notation for um, pulling back, mode out by torsion, and then push forward. Um, so we call these curves nearly Gorenstein. And it's interesting here. I mean, I will say two points. Nearly Gorenstein in the sense that the closest to be Gorenstein. I mean, Gorenstein's curves have no points, no Gorenstein, Gorenstein curves have no, no, no Gorenstein point, no non Gorenstein points. And this is the closest to be nearly Gorenstein. And interesting, only these curves have canonical model projectively normal. The proof here is harder. It involves Rosenlicht's result, which we reprove and restated as the fact that C prime is isomorphic to the blow up along the canonical and along the dualizing shift. So second part, linear series, gonality and scrolls. Uh, we follow the, the definition of linear series by Altman Kleiman, 1966, that a GDR is a, is a set of exact sequence like this, zero I, omega Q lambda, lambda in V, labeled by FV, and I'm gonna say who are the characters. F is a torsion-free sheaf of rank one on C with degree D. V is a subset of the global sections with dimension R plus one. I is home F omega. And if you take a global section, then I lambda is home lambda omega. 
So, well, this is a different approach, especially that we are putting Omega here and you're gonna have a code scheme rather than a Hilbert scheme. So we recall a definition by Ster and Rosa that a base point of the linear series is non-removable. If it remains a base point of the generated linear series, and with all that, we can define the gonality of C to be the smallest D such that C has a GD1. So here is an example that non-removable base point do exist. Take this simple curve, T3, T4, T5. It's contained in this cone, X, Z, Y, 2. Here is the draw of the curve. And note that each line LT, like the blue line here, meets C at a point here, LT, PT, and P. And so what we get is this is a G21 with a non removable base point. Why is it? Uh, non-removable because if you remove it, uh, you're gonna have a G11 and this curve is not P1, which is characterized by having a G11. So problems, well, the first is motivated by this picture. Besides hyperliptic curves, who else has gonality two? Well, hyperliptic curves are characterized by gonality two. But um, since we have now uh, uh, a wider definition of, of a linear series, you may have something else. So another characterization result, gonality of C is two. C is isomorphic to a curve of degree two n plus one in P n plus one lying on a cone. So note that it, this is exactly this situation for n equals two. You have here a, a, a curve of degree five in P three. C prime is the rational normal curve of degree G minus one in PG minus one. And C is either hyperliptic, which we know, it has a G21, which is base point three, or C is rational, nearly normal, if the G21 has an unremovable base point. And here, uh, I don't know if you still remember, but nearly normal curves appear, appear once more. Remember those, that they have the arithmetically normal model. And another traditional problem, is that, is it true that C is digonal if and only if C lies on a D minus one, whoa, whoa. On a, C lies on a D minus one fold scroll. Um, this has been addressed by many authors under different circumstances. And here are some, Enrique's Babbage, Andreotti Meyer, Schreier, Eisenberg, Harris, and then singular cases, Ster Rosa. And then I myself work with Marquesi, Nicolau Souza, the case where C is non Gorenstein, C irrational. And we had with Steve this result that yes, this is true. Gonality of C is D, if and only if C prime, not C. I mean, C doesn't work at all when. I say C is something, well, isomorphic to C, but it doesn't work at all. I mean, the gonality is D if and only if C prime, which in case C is non gorenstein is non-isomorphic, is the guy who plays this role that lies on a D minus one fold scroll and cannot lie on a scroll of small, smaller dimension. So here is just a, a quick argument to see how the scroll appears and how, well, among other things, this approach of linear series like that is so helpful. 
So suppose you take um, a linear series like the one we defined that computes gonality and set P equals to PV. Then we get an exact sequence, H0 of I, OP minus one, H0 of omega, OP, co-kernel of phi. And since the co-kernel is a bundle on P, we have a morphism PE to P80 of omega. And by construction, the image of PE is the scroll containing C prime <coughs> by construction. And it's of dimension, the dimension of the fiber. The fiber, the dimension of the fiber is H0 of omega minus H0 of phi. And H0 of phi, remember its home uh, F omega is H1 of F. And H0 of omega minus H1 of F is D minus one by Heman Hawk. So one interesting thing is that if C is of genus four, then C prime lies in P3 and one, one is able to draw. So a student of mine, um, put these pictures uh, for three curves. This is non gorenstein non gorenstein non gorenstein of genus four, um, not contain anyone that, oh, just this, I think. No, not containing P3, but uh, the canonical model, yes, is contained in P3. And then you can find the hypersurfaces where it's on, like for instance, here it's easy to recognize the scroll here as well, but here I'm sort of messed up. Anyway, these are nice pictures. And at the end, I'm gonna talk about the last part, which is Brionator uh, variety. Let WDR, be the Brionator variety and Ho the Brionator number. Steve Laxov and Kempf in 1972 proved that these variety are non empty as long as Ho is greater or equal to zero. Photon Lazarsfeld in 1981 reproved the result in a different way and prove connectedness if Ho is greater than zero. So the idea which is known is that if you take the universal sheaf PQ, PQ, PQ projections, uh, WDR appears as a degeneracy locus of these morphies of bundles on the Jacobian. Um, Renato. Uh, yes. Three minutes remaining. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Bundles on the J Jacobian and uh, WDR is DM minus G minus R um, of this morphes. And photon laser lasers failed said that the problem reduces to ampleness to prove to get an emptiness to ampleness of this um, bundle here, which reduces to ampleness of CM minus one plus P zero in CM, where CM is the symmetric product. For integral curves, uh, this first part can be adjusted and the problem reduces to ampleness of QM minus one plus P zero in QM, where QM now is a quote scheme. So Eduardo came up with this example. You take any singular point and the projectivization of the tangent space uh, 
never meets qm minus one plus p zero, where this p zero is a fixed point, a singular, uh, non singular fixed point. So this guy is not ample. So photon lasers failed, um, proved cannot be adjusted. And now we are following Steve. Steve, Lexov, and Kemp, uh, which is the way of applying Porteous formula plus Poincare's formula, and the work is in progress. So the math is over. The only picture I have <laughs> with Steve. <laughs> Do you remember that, Steve? No. <laughs> Junior. Oh. Hmm. That's my office. Huh? Yeah, it's in your office. It was taken January 16, 2020, a um, few days before COVID. Um, and it was with Ethan as well, who's mm -hmm. going to give the, the, the next talk. And, and thank you for your attention and patience. And also happy birthday, Steve, and thank you for all you have done to me. I mean, I, I won't say anything because, I mean, I thank you so much, Steve. That's it. Thank you for your kind words and a lovely talk. Yeah, thank you, Renato. Are there any questions for Renato? Well, if not, we can move on to the next talk. Renato, you can stop sharing. And okay. then Ethan can share. Oh, and Renato, I apologize. I think I read the wrong title before. Ah, yeah. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My eye skipped to the wrong line of the program. How do I, I stop sharing here? There's a button somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Ethan, you can share. Okay, so let me just, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, so let me just, let me just share my screen. Uh, this is not working. Ah. Um, wait just a second. Okay, can you see, can yeah, you see the slides very good. now? It's very good. Okay. Okay, let me, um, I'll introduce you. Our next speaker okay. is Ethan Cotterill and his title is Enumerative Geometry of Rank Loci. Proceed. Okay, so um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak at this event. Uh, I don't think any number of words can capture what, I don't know, what I could feel or what I could say to th say thank you, but I'll, I'll try uh, nevertheless. Um, so what I wanted to do today is tell a story that's structured around uh, six papers that spoke to me when I was a student. Um, so as you can see, these are papers by Steve, uh, and his students and collaborators. And uh, the first five of them were all written um, uh, within a short span of uh, several years during the 1970s. And then there's sort of in some sense an outlier which was written later. Um, but all of these papers have sort of a special residence for me. And I wanted to explain how they sort of fit into my own mathematical life. Um, uh, and I'll try referring to them by, by the labels on the, on the left-hand side, and maybe also recalling the authors as I go. So, um, uh, as Renato uh, and Israel and some others have, have already mentioned, um, Steve Kleiman's work in intersection theory is often related in one way or another to uh, the following basic paradigm. Uh, so if we're given a map of vector bundles um, over, over an algebraic variety, we'd like to count um, in some sense 
uh, some generalized sense, the number of points over which the fiber of the bundle map has rank at most some number k. Uh, and by count, um, I'm going to mean computing either a, a Chow or a cohomology class. And these rank loci appear everywhere and are fundamental for intersection theory. Um, so the first paper that I mentioned um, by Kleiman and Laksov, uh, Steve gave to me, gave a reprint uh, to me one afternoon at MIT when I was an undergrad. And it really played a crucial role in my learning to understand rank loci, and in particular rank loci as they relate to the geometry of the Grassmannian. So what is KL1 about? It's an entirely self-contained and comprehensive introduction to Schubert calculus. Um, from Schubert's point of view, although uh, as far as I know, cohomology and bundles didn't exist as such when, when Schubert was around. Um, and I find that it's a remarkable article because not only does it start from scratch, but it also includes a discussion of active research, much of which is still really relevant and active today. So it's the sort of article that you can read on several levels. And every time you look at it, you'll learn something new. Um, so in my own personal life, I, uh, I was an undergrad at MIT. I wrote a senior thesis under Steve. Uh, and following that, I, uh, I did a master's degree in Paris. And the summer after, uh, the sum that summer of 2002, uh, I attended Climate 60, which was actually my first international conference. Um, um, and I have memories from that, from that conference that, that, I, that I really cherish. Um, after completing my master's degree, I did a PhD under Joe Harris in Brill Nerther theory. Um, or in other words, uh, the thesis is about linear series on algebraic curves. And um, uh, it was very much informed by, um, uh, by these three articles by Kemp and Laksov, uh, uh, by Kleiman. Um, uh, which one was that one? Ah, right, our special subschemes in an argument of Severis, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and, uh, uh, and also KL2, which is, um, uh, yeah, which is the article with Laksov on, on the existence of special divisors. Um, and uh, so what's going on in these articles? Well, in Kemp and Laps Laksov, uh, Kemp and Laksov were Steve's students. Um, and this article is, uh, is really foundational because it contains a complete algebraic proof of Portis's formula for the cohomology class of a rank locus, um, whenever the co-dimension of that rank locus is the expected one. Um, so what does Portis's formula say? Well, it realizes the class of the rank locus as an explicit determinant in churn classes of the domain and target bundles. And um, Kemp and Laksov were motivated by applications to curve geometry. Um, so uh, what happened in uh, Kleiman Laksov 2 is they applied Porteus to compute the class uh, of the Brill Nerther locus of. Uh, linear series of uh, a fixed degree and production, productive dimension um, on a non-singular algebraic curve. Um, and uh, so Kleiman and, and Laksov used Porteus to re realize this class as an explicit positive multiple of a power of the theta class on the Jacobian of X and, um, and the upshot of this calculation is that that locus is always not empty, um, which is half of, uh, of the celebrated Bernardo theorem. Um, uh, 
Well, I did want to, I, I thought I would be remiss if, uh, if I didn't mention in some way um, Steve's uh, stress on uh, reading and especially writing mathematics, particularly because I wrote a phase two paper at MIT with, with, with Steve. Um, and uh, K2, which is uh, Steve's article on, uh, on an argument of Severi's. Uh, so he, he dedicates K2 to the memory of Norman Levison, who, as he said, understood life and appreciated mathematics with classical roots. Um, in, in K2, uh, Steve reduces the, uh, the remainder of the brill noether theorem, which is to say uh, the dimensionality statement uh, for uh, the GRD locus on a, on a curve that's general in moduli to a, dimension, a dimensional transversality statement for uh, D minus R minus one planes intersecting G general secant lines uh, to a rational normal curve in, in P to the D. And um, this article exemplifies Steve's mathematical culture and his reading of other mathematicians. In doing so, he builds on previous work of Severi, uh, who had presented an incomplete proof of, of the brill noether theorem. Um, and I should also say that ultimately, uh, K2 was, uh, was, an was, an, was an integral ingredient in uh, Griffin, as in Griffiths and Harris's uh, proof of Real Norther, uh, in which they, they proved this dimensional transversality statement. Steve has been, uh, has been a very important figure in building bridges between mathematical communities in at least Norway, Brazil, and the US, which are sort of the three countries in which I'm most aware of his, his mathematical interactions outside the US. Um, when I was undergrad at MIT, I wrote a thesis um, that built on uh, the article JK uh, by Trigvi Janssen and, and Steve Kleiman. Uh, so that paper is, uh, is a proof of Kleiman's conjecture about the finiteness of rational curves of degree at most nine on a general quintic threefold in P4. Um, so my undergraduate thesis was about the case of degree 10. Um, but I sort of only appreciated later to what extent in that paper, so a very important subsidiary theme in that paper is, uh, is dimension counting for linear series so is, is counting conditions imposed by singularities on, of particular types on linear series, um, um, which in turn relates to this very nice survey article K2, um, uh, the enumerative theory of singularities, um, which is a comprehensive uh, treatment of uh, sort of a new, uh, the enumeration of singularities from this rank locus point of view. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I mentioned this too, because um, in the last nine years, uh, Renato Vidal Martins and I and our students have spent a lot of time reconsidering and, and sort of reworking and generalizing those dimension counts of Janssen and Kleiman using tools coming from valuation theory. Um, and uh, sort of a philosophical point that we try to address and that we're interested in now is sort of to what extent the, the local geometry of say a curve singularity, a fixed delta invariant recapitulates the global geometry of a smooth curve of genus G. Um, and yeah, this to a certain extent was already addressed by Renato in, in his talk. To finish, I wanted to say something about my own research. Uh, so I wanted to say something about rank loci over arbitrary fields. Um, 
Um, to a certain extent, this, this also uh, was touched on by Abramo uh, in relation to his thesis work. Um, but uh, the difference here is that I want to work within the context of A1 homotopy theory uh, in the sense of Morel and Blavatsky. Um, and the point essentially is that what originally was uh, a topological theory has been repurposed more recently um, uh, to impressive effect in the context of algebraic geometry by uh, people such as Jesse Cass, Kirsten Wickelgren, and, and Mark Levine, uh, among others. Uh, so, uh, enumerative, by enumerative formulas in A1 homotopy theory, I mean formula, formulas that are valued in the Grothendieck Witt group uh, of quadratic forms over, over a field. Um, the point is that you take the group completion of, uh, so addition is, is, is direct sum, multiplication is tensor product, and you take the group completion. And the growth and unique fit group has a standard presentation in terms of generators and relations. It's something that you can actually compute. Uh, so for example, uh, the growth and unique fit group um, of C, or actually of any algebraically closed field, uh, is, is Z because every quadratic form is determined up to isomorphism by its rank. Um, on the other hand, the growth and unique group of the real numbers is two copies of Z, Z plus Z, uh, because uh, over R, quadratic forms are characterized by their rank and their signature, whereas over a finite field of characteristic not equal to two, the growth and unique group is, uh, is Z plus Z plus two. Uh, so, this is all of this is to say that you should think of enumerative formulas valued in growth and equit as decorated analogs of, of classical formulas. Now there's a technical caveat here, which is that we usually require, first of all, the rank locus to be realizable as a zero dimensional Euler class. So that is to say is the zero locus of a section of a bundle of rank equal to the dimension of the variety on which over which we're working. Um, this actually isn't such an ironclad requirement, but it's the typical requirement. And the second um, is that our bundle be uh, relatively orientable, which is to say that, well, that's a technical requirement. I don't want to belabor that point, but it means that hum of uh, the determinant of the tangent to the determinant of the bundle B uh, is a tensor square. Okay, so um, why am I interested in, uh, in this technology? Because I want to apply it to produce decorated versions of, of classical enumerative formula for linear series on curves. Again, um, pushing this, uh, uh, this idea of, of doing mathematics with very classical roots, but from uh, a modern point of view. So what's a prototypical example of this the situation, this sort of situation where this would work. Well, it's Pluker's formula for the total inflection of, uh, of a linear series on a curve. Uh, and the point is that over the complex numbers, the total inflection of a linear series is an explicit polynomial um, deterministically prescribed by the genus, the projective dimension, and the degree, uh, which is equal to the determinant of uh, of a principal parts bundle, uh, J R plus one of L, or L is the underlying line bundle. Um, uh, and the reason for that is that the inflection locus is exactly the non-surjectivity locus of a natural evaluation map that I wrote down here from V tensor O to, to this jet bundle. Uh, so, um, in a recent paper with Ignacio Darago and uh, and Chang Ho Han, uh, which is which is slated to appear in Nachrichten soon, uh, we proved an A1 analog or an A1 enrichment of Pluker's formula for arbitrary multiples of the G12 on a hyperelliptic curve over a field not of characteristic two. And and just a word about sort of the various hypotheses that are operative in this statement. Um, basically, well. So 
it's easy to see from this description, description of the inflectionary locus that you can realize it as an Euler class because you just take the determinant of this evaluation map. Um, uh, on the other hand, the fact that we work with G12 is multiples of G12 on a hyperelliptic curve uh, is in order to satisfy this relative orientability uh, requirement. Um, and it turns out that that actually sort of the global Kluker formula just turns out to be sort of a predictable multiple of this distinguished hyperbolic class one plus minus one. Um, uh, it would require more time to describe every you know, carefully the meaning of these symbols, but um, uh, but we also give explicit formulas for local A1 inflectionary indices. And, and part of this, why, part of why this is possible is that uh, the description of the sections of these linear series is completely explicit. So we can really, we can really describe uh, explicitly the local inflectionary behavior as well. Um, so just to finish, uh, I've said all that I wanted to say, that I wanted to leave you with an image um, and I wanted to thank you, Steve, for, uh, for your friendship uh, and your mentorship. In some ways, I, I've always felt that uh, talking about mathematics with Steve is a lot like uh, talking to a friend in which the idea is that you sort of share secrets with your friend. And, and, and so uh, I spent a lot of time in Steve's office with him patiently explaining, uh, you know, timeless mathematical secrets. So, so thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you for your kind words. Yes, let's clap. Okay, are there any questions? Well, if not, I, we're scheduled for a break now. Eduardo, shall we have a break for 15 minutes and 21 seconds? <laughs> right. That would be a long break for us now. <laughs> That's <Yeah. good>. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we're going to resume at the scheduled time. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank I you. guess you can stop recording temporarily. Okay. So as we move from east to west, it's time now for our US-based friends. And the first uh, speaker now is going to be Susan Colley from the Edwin College. And she's going to talk about monsters on a train. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me. It's really nice to see all my math siblings and friends again. Um, and, uh, Hi, Susan. Oh, hi, Beverly. <laughs> and to see my other math friend. He's hugging the sound. Hi, oh, Susan. Okay. Good to see you. Hi, hi. And it's even nice to be uh, in Brazil, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> my students on here in Brazil right now for the afternoon. Um, okay. So, uh, of course, um, Steve, um, I, of course, can't forget you on this special time. And I know it's a little premature, but I want to make sure I send my birthday greetings now uh, before it's too late. And um, so I want to say a word or two about uh, Monsters on a Train. And um, this is perhaps lighter weight than some of the other talks, because I'm only going to speak about a few aspects here and there of, of uh, recent work. And really, this work came from originally uh, um, a construction that um, I was looking at in the algebraic geometry context for compactifying curvilinear data so that I could handle some enumerative questions. So that's my connection to Steve. But what's fascinating is that this has also turned up in other areas of mathematics and we did not know about this until maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and those other areas are in differential geometry, where one studies Gorsa distributions uh, of tangent bundles to manifolds, and also surprisingly even in control theory, where one analyzes a, a mechanical system of a truck with trailers. And uh, so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about items numbers one and three, because uh, it's a birthday celebration, and because that's really all that I have time to do. Um, 
this is a large project that's still ongoing with my longtime collaborator, Gary Kennedy from Ohio State, and our new collaborator, Corey Shanbrum from Sacramento State. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Gary, who shared some slides, shared a lot of figures uh, that made this talk feasible, or more feasible. So uh, a word or two about compactify and curvilinear data. Um, I'm mainly interested in data over the plane, real or complex. And um, let's just start with a couple of curves that pass through a common point, and uh, for the moment at least have non-vertical tangent lines there. We're going to say that they have the same curvilinear data up to order k. If the derivatives up to order k agree at that point, at that common point. So for an elementary example, one can look at the parabola at its vertex and compute derivatives. And then at that vertex point, the derivatives give these, these data. One can do the same thing for the unit circle at the same point and perhaps using implicit differentiation, maybe, one finds these data. Um, so there's a picture of what's going on. And of course, one can see that since the first, second, and third derivatives agree, the curves have the same curvilinear data up to order three, but of course, not up to order four. Now, for curves to agree in curvilinear data up to order k is k conditions. These are independent of the local coordinates that one might choose. So when working over the plane, uh, curvilinear data of order k is really just a point in some manifold of dimension two plus k. Indeed, there's a tower of these manifolds, starting with say the plane is the base manifold. Um, fiber at each point is going to be a P1 of those directions. And after that, at least for the moment, the, uh, the fibers are going to be affine lines after that. Now, uh, we can lift a non-singular plane curve up through this tower, and we're just getting a Nash blow up if we do that. The problem is that starting at the second stage, this sort of naive approach does not give compact fibers. But fortunately, there's a nice old paper of simples that gives a really lovely compactification uh, of a tower of P1 bundles over the plane. And this is the Semple Tower, sometimes called the Semple de Maille Tower. But um, we've started to call it in accord with the differential geometers, the Monster Tower. And um, the individual spaces that appear in the tower are <clears throat> what we'll call monster spaces. The additional points are, of course, data that gets associated to singular curves. So a word about this construction that we've used. Um, let me start with just a smooth manifold M, which um, might just as well be a non-singular algebraic variety. Uh, let's assume the dimension of M is little m. So I'm going to look at a general construction here, but mainly I'm going to be focusing on the case where M is the plane. Nonetheless, we can. I can introduce the, the general uh, uh, point of view. Uh, let's take a, a bundle B, a sub bundle of the tangent bundle of rank B, little b. And then we can project, projectivize that sub bundle and we get a new space, M tilde. And a point P tilde of this new space, M tilde, that lies over a point in the base space represents a line inside the fiber of the bundle, the sub bundle B at the point P. And uh, since the bundle B is a sub bundle of the tangent bundle, this is just a tangent direction. And so you get a picture like this uh, when the base is two dimensional. You have a point P down below, a point P tilde up on the manifold, the new uh, space M tilde. And you have a fiber of tangent directions at the point P on the base. So in particular, P tilde represents a, spe a, partic uh, a particular direction uh, down on the, on the base. OK, so to repeat, uh, M tilde is the projectivization of this subbundle uh, B. There's a derivative map. And then we can define um, a focal vector to be a tangent vector to M tilde, a P tilde, uh, if it's mapped down 
to the to the tangent direction at p that's represented by p tilde. So here are three scenarios. The leftmost one is a focal vector. So one has this tangent vector v to m tilde at p tilde, and it's mapped by the derivative in accord with the direction that p tilde represents. The middle situation is where we have a non-focal vector. The tangent vector to m tilde is not mapping to the direction represented by p tilde. And the one on the right is uh, the vertical situation where the, um, uh, uh, the, the vector v is mapping to zero by the derivative. And so we are having some tangency to the fiber up here, okay? We're going to consider the vertical vectors to be focal. Um, and the set of all these focal vectors gives rise to a subbundle b tilde inside of the tangent bundle to m tilde. And what's important about this is that the rank of this new subbundle b tilde is again b, same as the original bundle b. And that means we can just iterate this and we get a tower of spaces and bundles associated to them. If we start by letting b be the entire tangent bundle, then we get the monster tower, the simple tower, uh, starting with the base space uh, m as m0, then the first space will be just, uh, just a projectivized uh, tangent bundle. More generally, mk, the kth monster space, if you will, is just going to be the total space of a pm minus one bundle over the monster that's directly below. Uh, one needs to do this because if one simply tries projectivizing tangent bundles, the growth of dimensions is much too rapid. But doing it this way, you have nice controlled growth. Um, we're gonna call the bundle that we get at step K of this particular situation, starting with B equal to the tangent bundle, we'll call this uh, the special bundle, the focal bundle. And it too is this subbundle of the tangent bundle to the case monster space. Um, the vertical directions that one encounters on MK minus one give rise to a divisor at infinity on MK. So these vertical directions um, uh, um, have to do with tangency to the fiber uh, and begin at when K is two. So we start with a first the first divisor at infinity one encounters is at level two and um, comes from tangency to the fiber one level below. So here's an example of what one can do with all of this. Suppose one starts with a parametrized plane curve, we can start computing derivatives. So we can compute y prime easily enough, we compute y double prime easily enough, but if we try to compute a third derivative, by just continuing this process, we're going to get a T in a denominator. So instead we're going to invert and compute dx by dy double prime, call this new thing x prime. And then with this information, we get um, a curve in the third monster space in the chart consisting of coordinates x, y, y prime, y double prime, and this new thing x prime, which is kind of an inversion. And if you set t equals zero, we get the data over the origin. And what's notable about all of this, here's the curve we were looking at. That's this black curve that has a rhamphoid cusp. Uh, the tangent line to this curve at the origin is horizontal. It has the same second order data as a parabola, but the third order data is infinite because of that new term x prime that was an inversion of what we would perhaps want to think of as y triple prime. So this third order data being infinite tells us that the curve that one can lift through the tower in this way is meeting this third divisor at infinity. Now, also interesting about all of this is when we start with a surface, you can associate a code word in each of the monster spaces um, from an alphabet of three symbols, R, V, and T. The rules for forming this code, code word are very simple. They're just two rules. Every code word will start with an R and uh, the symbol T cannot immediately follow an R, but otherwise one can construct arbitrary code words in this way. 
R is supposed to sigma, signify uh, regular or smooth or non-singular. If you see a V in position K of the uh, code word, you're hitting the kth divisor at infinity. If you see a T, that means that at the immediately prior uh, V in the code, you are either tangent or, or highly tangent to the corresponding divisor of infinity to that V. Um, these code words give rise to loci that stratify each of the strat that stratify each of the monster spaces in this tower. Um, here are the code word, the code words one can get at level three and curves that represent each of them, oops, over the origin, excuse me. Um, one can also give a similar code word and stratification for uh, the monster tower over higher dimensional spaces, but the, the script is a little more complicated. And this is a birthday party, so I want to keep things. Uh, I want to keep things light. So that's a, a short chorus in the monster tower. Now I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, the control theory side of things. And uh, here. This really owes to an observation of uh, Richard Montgomery at Mikhail Zudermirsky, who noted that you can really put together a kind of an oriented version of the monster tower construction, starting with a base space of just the plane. And if you do that, you get a uh, configuration space for a very well-known mechanical system, namely a train consisting of a truck and trailers. So, uh, that's what we have here is a truck for trailers. So each truck, uh, ha, uh, each of uh, the truck is at the head, excuse me. The trailers are shown in red and blue. Each trailer for this configuration is gonna be um, uh, idealized to just be a point with a unit vector that points towards the, the trailer that's directly in front of it. The truck, which you can think of as trailer zero, can point in any direction. And if you do this, you get a configuration space that just consists of the plane together with n plus one copies of circles. And a point of the configuration space can be denoted by x, y, and a bunch of phi's. And here's the picture. The phi's, of course, are going to represent angles. x, y is just recording the position of the final trailer in this train right here at the back. The truck is at the front. The angles phi one through three n are bending angles that are telling you how each trailer is uh, uh, turned with respect to the one behind it. The very last uh, angle in the configuration, the phi zero angle is really the heading angle of the trailer. So obviously it's clear what to do next. Drive the truck and watch what happens to the trailers. And the motion is um, constrained by two conditions, a so-called holonomic constraint, which is simply that the trailers are linked by these, uh, by these unit length uh, distances. And then a non-holonomic constraint, which is that the velocity vector has to always point in the direction that the trailer is pointing. And that's determined by the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, bending angles. So the constraints, give rise to a system of differential equations. And if you know the path of the truck, you can solve the differential equations through an integration process to find the paths of the trailers. But what's interesting and gives the connection to uh, uh, the first part of this talk is that one can go in the other direction. Suppose you know the path or have the desired path of the trailer, then you can find the paths of the previous trailers going forward uh, using a kind of differentiation process. For example, uh, suppose you want the last trailer to follow this black curve here. Then um, at every point, all you need to do is draw the, a unit tangent vector, since that's determining the heading, and look at the tips of those unit tangent vectors. That gives rise to this dashed blue curve, and that's the curve that you need the trailer in front of it to follow. And one just has to repeat that. Now that we know uh, the next to the last trailer's path, we can get the one before that. 
and so on, right till we get to the front and get to the truck. And what's nice is you get some very interesting configurations in this way. If, for example, you would just like the last trailer in this, con in this configuration to turn but not move, you can choose the bending angles in a very special way. You just need the bending angles to be uh, arc sine of uh, one over root K. So that means for this first bending angle here, that should be a 90 degree angle, pi over two. The next one should be 45 degrees. The next one arc sine of uh, uh, one over root three and so forth till one gets to the truck. And what will happen is each of these trailers is then going to move in a circle of radius uh, root K. And no turning from trailer to trailer. It's as if the entire configuration is rigid. So this is a very singular configuration. You uh, cannot move this last trailer through any infinitesimal motions of the truck at the front. In fact, we can even make a fancier version of this by um, packing some further trailers on the end of the trailer we were just looking at. And if you do that, these last trailers, these new ones, don't move whatsoever. The uh, beginning of the train moves around these circles. This trailer doesn't move, and only this angle between uh, uh, here and here would be changing. And in fact, we can even make sense of the code words in this context. So you can read off an RVT code word from the bending angles. Uh, one does this from back to front, starting by labeling the rear trailer with an R because all the code words have to start with R. If at any point, one of the bending angles though is, is 90 degrees, I'm gonna write a V in that position. If we see the sequence of special bending angles up to an overall plus or minus sign, then uh, wherever this sequence begins, we're gonna start, we're gonna write a V and then we're gonna follow with T's until the sequence start, stops. Um, everywhere else, we're just gonna write an R. And the significance of all of this is code words that have these so-called critical symbols of V or T are the ones that are hard to control. The ones that can't be uh, uh, moved easily uh, through infinitesimal motions of the initial train. So um, for a stationary train, the code word is uh, RV TTTTT. Uh, I know this because um, for the stationary train here, uh, these bending angles are all part of that special sequence. Um, on the other hand, one can take a more random code word like this and uh, see what kind of train would have such a code word. Here it is. So the truck is here, the last trailer is here. One reads the code word going from the last trailer to the front by just looking at the angles. So uh, R, then there's a 90 degree bend, so V. No special bend here, so an R, another bend uh, pi over two, but after that, we see the beginning of that special sequence, pi over two, pi over four, arc sine, uh, uh, one over root three. So we put a V here, follow it with T's, but once we get here, we have another one. We don't have a continuation of that sequence, but we do have another pi over two bending angle. So that gets a V. And then finally, we've reached the truck with no special bending angle. So we put an R. And one can do this for um, any train. Um, so these are just aspects of some of the things we were thinking about. And um, what I wanted to say is if uh, Steve hadn't introduced me to enumerative geometry, I wouldn't have ever found out about the simple construction. And if I hadn't known about that, I wouldn't have found out from other colleagues about the connection to differential geometry and control theory. So uh, your reach is, is very, very long, Steve. Uh, but I also wanted to say more than that. Um, like others, uh, you've always been supportive. Uh, but to me, you've been more than supportive at, 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 critical, at a critical time, and you know when, um, your generosity, your kindness, when you knew me very, not very well at all, was crucial. And in um, 
both intellectual ways and in personal ways, I would have had no career in mathematics had it not been for you and your generosity towards me. So thank you and happy birthday. Thank you. That's very touching. And uh, let me show you something you may remember. I'm going to stop the share now so I can see it. Ah, that's the count. He's back. <laughs> and he's, here there. he's here with me as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, someone should. For this beautiful talk and your very emotional words. Yeah. Any yeah. questions, anyone? Yeah, I have a question. What What is the backstory on those Sesame Street figurines? Uh, <laughs> oh, it was Sundance 1986. Steve brought a picture of the count because the count is the best enumerative geometer of them all, even better than Steve. <laughs> oh <laughs> well he loves to count yeah that's right and he sings when he counts <coughs> oh and then there was the marvelous mumford ah yes <laughs> <laughs> well that's why i had to put some kind of of cartoon picture at the beginning of the talk i i couldn't find the count with a train so i had to find a picture of a monster with a train <laughs> Very <Yeah>. nice. <laughs> and right. Sugarloaf behind you. I'm sorry. Yes, and Sugarloaf is behind me. Well, I mean, yeah, right. I mean, I am supposed to be in Rio right now. <laughs> is that correct. Virtually. It's it's a pity that I mean we have had so many celebrations and this time uh, it didn't work out to do it. Uh, yeah, but uh, okay. it, it's nice to be here with all the world is. <laughs> all right. So uh, if there are no more questions to to Susan, uh, let's move on. Let's move on to the next speaker, uh, Dan Abinin from Missouri. And he's going to talk on the integral chowrings of stacks of hyperelliptic uh, bias transports. All right, thank you, thank you, Eduardo. And let's see. So I I'm on uh, two devices. So somehow the hope is that I'll share on my iPad, and you'll see me on the on the laptop. This is one of the skills I learned during the pandemic, right? How to how to do stuff like this. All right. And ta-da, just take a second. That's Colorado, that picture. Um, okay, so this, this, so you can all see the, the, um, the, the, the notes and you can, you can see me, right? I hope. Um, all right, excellent. So, um, so I want to talk about work uh, with my student, Jen Ning Hu, who's actually, she's here on the Zoom as well. Uh, and it's on, on chow rings of, of stacks of hyperelliptic wire stress points. So this is a, a business I've been in for a while, um, computing chow rings of various, integral chow rings of, of various moduli spaces. Um, certainly I was, I was very influenced by Steve's work in intersection theory. Um, this, this project, uh, we became interested in hyperelliptic curves and I have been on and off for a while. Um, and Actually, I learned a lot from this paper of Steve's, which he never told me about when I was in graduate school, actually. I don't, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> so th this, is a, this is a very nice paper of his. And it, 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 was, it was, I didn't, I started graduate school after 1979. So, so it was there, but I guess in, in graduate school, I wasn't particularly interested in hyperelliptic curves. So he probably never suggested I, I read it. So I, I'm going to, to start with, um, some, some basics, this is the title of the paper of Kleiman and Lundstedt, Basics on Families of, of Hyperelliptic Curves. And you know, one of the nice things about this paper is, is it's, it's so very careful. So a lot of people, when they do hyperelliptic curves, they, the first thing they tell you is they, they can't think about characteristic P, characteristic two rather, because it's, it's too hard. 
And um, these guys, you know, they 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 get it all in in arbitrary, you know, they they get it without an assumption on characteristic. Um, and then, you know, they explain what what characteristic, assuming characteristic not two is going to help you for. So I, I'm I'm going to start with uh, paraphrasing a, a theorem. Of, oops, this, I can write on this. So this is a, a theorem in in their paper. I, I I didn't copy it verbatim, but I I paraphrased it. So you have a so in in the language they said they had a, a smooth projective family of curves. So the point is the fibers are are proper. And they even say that proper is sufficient, of course, if the genus is, is more than two. And so they, they have three equivalent conditions on a curve. And uh, so one is that it, it factors, so it's a family of curves. So it should have a, a um, it should uh, factor, I feel like I forgot a word, uh, a couple of words here, the morphism P factors. Uh, and then, then this should have degree H is equal to two, right? It should factor as a, a double cover, but not of a single P1, but of a family of P1s. But they, they doesn't have to be P1 over the base, right? So it's a it's a, a twisted P1 is, is the term they use. Uh, the second condition is that it has an involution. And on every geometric fiber, the quotient of the involution is isomorphic too. So you 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 make the, the involution will act on every geometric fiber and because it's it's constant over S, and then the quotient is isomorphic to P1. Um, and then the third condition is that the image of the canonical morphism. So you take you take the vector bundle omega one c over s and um, and uh, push it forward to s and take proj of that, and that's that's going to be a twisted p one. And this formation commutes with base change. And so that's that that was and again this is this doesn't require a, an assumption on characteristic. And they say that a curve is hyperliptic if it satisfies any or all of the conditions of the theorem. And so that, that allows us to consider a stack of hyperliptic curves. This paper doesn't specifically use the term stack, but, but it's, it's clearly helping us understand uh, the stack. And so strictly speaking, what you can do is define a category fibered and groupoids, uh, which is families of hyperliptic curves. So that's the objects in your category. And your morphisms are, are the usual morphisms of curves. So that's that's commutative diagrams of curves of a, of a given genus. And you can make a deformation theory argument that, that this category fibered and groupoids is, is I mean, so what we would say now is it's a, it's a Deline Mumford stack because it's a closed stack, substack of the moduli stack um, of curves of genus G. And these are, these are all smooth curves. So that's, so thanks to that paper, we, you know, we have a careful description of what, what it means to consider families of hyperelliptic curves. Um, I guess, I don't know if this is the, I mean, th this is really a nice, like I said, it's, it's the first careful consideration of this problem that I know of. And um, so we're interested in, in, in wire stress divisors. And so um, again, a very careful description of uh, what should the wire stress divisor be on a family. So. They tell you, um, so you can consider, so we have a hyperelliptic, you know, I use this term family, they, they use just singular hyperelliptic curve over the base S. You can consider the image of the canonical morphism and you can either, so then you can look at the, um, the ramification locus or the, um, of either, it doesn't really matter whether you look at, at the ramification locus of F or of, of sort of the actual sort of double cover C to D. And then you put a scheme structure on it with the with the zero fitting ideal, and this is this is they call this the the Weierstrass subscheme, um, and uh, so and again no restriction on characteristic, uh, they can prove right that this this is so I a little bit short with the language it's an effective divisor so it's so it's it's represented by uh, an effective cardi I mean it's an effective divisor but it's it's represented by an effective Cartier divisor. And that that divisor is that scheme is finite and flat of as you would expect two g plus two wire stress points on a hyperelliptic curve. And again, its formation commutes with base change, which is sort of crucial if you're going to consider moduli. Uh, you can also view it as a fixed scheme. So if you have you have this involution as part of the data of a hyperelliptic curve, and so then this 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 is a a W, not an omega. So that's supposed to be a capital W, my handwriting maybe. It's not the canonical divisor. 
And um, so, and that sub scheme is a, is a fixed scheme. And if you work over a field, so again, they're very careful to tell you if you work over a fixed, over a field of characteristic not equal to two, then this, this um, divisor is a tall over the base, right? So is a tall, I didn't say over what, over S, right? And so, um, so now we know what the virus stress divisor is on a family. And uh, we can also talk about a virus stress section. So again, there's, there's sort of a couple of natural characterizations and it's nice, nice to see that they sort of fit together. So one characterization of a hyperelliptic virus stress point, of course, is twice the point is a G12. And so the, the definition they give is that a, a virus stress section is a section tau such that if you push forward O of tau, and that's a, that's a tensor squared, uh, that, that's gonna be a rank two vector bundle. And, um, and then they, they again, I'm, I'm sort of kind of uh, summarizing a couple of, of statements in their paper, uh, but a, a projective curve is, is gonna be hyperelliptic, is equivalent that it, it acquires a virus stress section after some faithfully flat base change. And of course, they, we're assuming the genus is, is, is at least two. And also that a section is a virus stress section, if and only to factors through this, this virus stress divisor. And again, this is all this is all done very nicely with families. So it, it, it naturally lends itself to defining the correct stacks. And so we can define, again, strictly speaking, we're defining a, a category fibered in, in groupoids. Uh, the, so I have to give you objects and morphisms. So the objects are a C over S and tau is a virus stress section. I don't have to tell you that C is hyperelliptic. It's redundant, right? Because you can't have a virus stress section without being um, hyperelliptic. And then the morphisms are the usual morphisms of, of pointed, pointed curves. And again, you can, you can show that HGW is a closed substack of HG1, which is the universal hyperelliptic curve. And uh, it's going to be finite and characteristic not equal to two. It's going to be a tall over, over the moduli of um, hyperelliptic curves. And so um, you can keep going and uh, you can consider a stack where you have two wire stress points. You can, so it's, it's two markings and each of them is a wire stress point. And you can, you eventually have to stop, right? Because you only, you only have two G plus two virus stress points on each curve. So you, you get a tower of, of where each, um, the degree of, e, of each map, you know, it, it's two G plus two and then two G plus one all the way up. So the total degree of this covering is two G plus two factorial, right? So this is a, this is an atal covering of degree, again, in characteristic not equal to two, degree two G plus two factorial. And of course, so each of these, uh, each hyperelliptic curve gives you a corresponding family of rational curves with a divisor marked on it. And if you, if you don't, you know, you don't, haven't specified any virus stress point, so that's the branch divisor, then you're looking at um, the moduli space of rational curves uh, with 2G plus two markings modulo the symmetric group. So that's, that's the moduli space. So that's the moduli stack of rational curves uh, plus a divisor of degree 2G plus two, which, is, which has to be a tall over the base, right? So which has to be a tall over the base, right? So you can't, you can't have them collide. And then you build your way up and you get, you get um, the moduli space of, of, of just pointed curves. If, you, if you've marked every wire stress point, you've labeled them all. And so again, you have a, a sequence of coverings here, right? So, um, and so the horizontal maps, it's maybe a little hard to read, right? It takes a, a curve and a bunch of virus stress sections. So tau one up to tau k are going to this virus stress divisor. And you take the quotient by, by sigma, that gives you a, this uh, twisted family of P1s. And the sort of way to write this very short quickly is you take WPS mod sigma. So that's the branch divisor. And um, so each of these horizontal maps is, uh, is what's called a, a B mu two gerb. So it, it's, it's essentially associated to taking the square root of a line bundle and a line bundle is the line bundle associated to the branch divisor. 
So each of these horizontal maps sort of fits in. So we have this nice diagram. And um, so about, well, I guess in 2009, Damiano Fulgesu and I wrote a paper where we computed the integral chow ring of, of this moduli space, HG, um, or moduli stack, I should say. And then when G was even, and then later Damiano and, and Viviani, and then um, with some also some work of Andrea Di Lorenzo, computed this in the odd case uh, when G is odd. So essentially we knew the integral chow ring of these, of this. And so the project was, well, what about all these intermediate, you know, all these moduli spaces? And then of course, how do they fit in with these, with these germs? And um, so it's actually actually, I mean, it's easy in, in, in retrospect, like, like a lot of mathematics, um, but actually I, I owe, so this, this is an observation of Dan Peterson's Okay, that once, once you get sort of, if you count from the bottom, this is level zero, level one, level two, once you get to level three, uh, this gerb is, is a trivial gerb. So in other words, this, this stack is isomorphic to this thing, which is actually open in the affine space cross, uh, cross B mu two. And so you can calculate the chow rings pretty easily. And so most, most of the difficulty is sort of down in this part of the of the of the tower, and so um, so the the integral, like I said, the integral chow rings of HG were were previously composed by myself and Damiano in the even case, and then there's there's two papers uh, where the odd is computed, and we we kind of so Zhen Ning and I filled in the rest of this the story these these moduli spaces of of wire stress points, and again I I think I wouldn't have thought about thinking about this problem, except I, I stumbled upon um, this paper of Steve's. Again, <laughs> I will say no thanks to Steve, except he wrote the paper. So I, I do say thanks to Steve, right? Because it's a beautiful and very clear paper. So and it, and it made me realize I could, I could think about these moduli spaces of wire stress points. And so we then calculated all of these integral chow rings. And um, so again, the, the top is, is a pretty, these are all gonna be Z because it, they're again, they're open sets in affine space. And then these stacks, they just have to be, they have to be Z mod, Z joint T mod 2T because of this triviality of the gerb. And the interesting story is, um, is here. And so for example, the, the moduli, so that actually this space was also not calculated. So we, we had to calculate that one. And um, so for example, you see here, right, that this, this thing is generated by one generator and this relation, so the, uh, has degree, um, whatever that is, 8G squared plus 4G, and that's in the gerb, and notice it's it's double, you know, the, the order of like each each chow group, so like pick, for example, is order a, you know, 4G times 2G plus one, whereas here it's 2G times 2G plus one, and you, you're seeing that, that gerb phenomenon. So um, because this is only a 20 minute talk, I, I sort of, it's probably not a good idea to, to um, go into how we prove this. Um, again, the, this part, there wasn't much to do. So it was really these, these, these two calculations here and, and then this calculation had to be done. Um, and, uh, but we, we, were, we were definitely influenced. So there was, a, there was a presentation. And unfortunately these results require more than characteristic not equal to two um, you, because some of the chow ring computations require slightly bigger characteristics. So let's just say characteristic uh, big enough. And uh, so we, we used a presentation um, I, uh, of, of HG1 as a quotient stack. Um, by Michaela Pernice, and I'm not going to pronounce his last name correctly, but uh, his first name, as Angela told me, is, is Michaela, even though I would read that as Michelle, but um, so it's Michaela Pernice, and um, so we, we used that and we modified that to get nice um, quotient stack presentations, and then we used the usual trick that, of computing equivariant chart groups, and again, since 
I have a 20 minute talk. It's probably a good, good place to stop. But it, again, I, I like, I want, I was happy to talk about this um, in part because it's been what's on my mind, but also because, you know, I learned a lot from reading this paper of Steve's. And, and so he was already on my mind. And then Eduardo said uh, that, you know, we're having this, this conference. And actually I only found out about the conference probably about 10 days later than I should have because uh, we have a very aggressive spam folder here. So we decided that Eduardo's message was spam. And, um, <laughs> luckily the second message got through. And so I was, I was able, I'm really happy to be able to participate. And so let me just write the iPad here. So happy birthday. All right, so that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for the birthday greetings and, and for your talk. It, it reminds me of another principle I learned from Oscar Zariski, and that is that um, you know your work is a success when uh, it leads somewhere in someone else's work. So well, uh, definitely, yeah, definitely was uh, influential. And I, I think it's amusing because I had never read it in, in graduate school, right? So, so I, I, I it, I found it my way to your paper somehow or other because they, you know, with a math signet search probably on papers and on hybrid. I mean, the title was easy. To, it was a good title because uh, <laughs> <laughs> easy to easy to find that. Wonderful that it all worked out. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, thanks for the nice paper <laughs> and more. And thanks for all the all the all the great advising too over the over the years. So. You're very welcome. Okay, more questions, comments? So one thing that we've learned from Steve is how to write well, and certainly giving a good title is a, is a very good start. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example. <laughs> All right. So uh, our last speaker of today is uh, the one that uh, presented the plaque to Steve. So it was our first speaker and now the last one is Dan Grayson. And he's gonna talk on uh, acyclic binary complexes in algebraic K theory. Okay. Then we are not hearing you. Oh, somehow when I started sharing, it, the mute button disappeared. So oh. now I'm unmuted. And let me share the screen again. Is recording on? Yes, it's, it's on already. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm using the lowest tech presentation technology of anyone today. And um, my thesis under Stephen, um, that was a time I remember well, and um, it was, the goal of it was to mix algebraic geometry and algebraic K-theory. And now um, algebraic geometry has advanced to include motivic cohomology. And we saw a hint of that in a previous talk. And the material I'll present today is something I like to think about whenever I find myself in a coffee shop with a cappuccino in front of me. And I, I, I want to, I don't yet know how to mix it with algebraic geometry, in other words, with motivic cohomology, but I'll, I'll tell you what it's about. And um, so, what is it about? Well, um, We start with an exact category. And an exact category is some sort of generalization of an abelian category. Typically, you would think of it as being a full subcategory of an abelian category. And for example, it could be the coherent sheaves 
the category of coherent sheaves on a variety. It could be the category of coherent sheaves of co-dimension greater than or equal to P on a variety. It could be the category of locally free coherent sheaves on a variety. And there are a variety of these things. <clears throat> so there's um, K theory. Um, well, the main thing about an exact category is that it has a notion of short exact sequence. So a typical short exact sequence might look like this. And in the examples I just mentioned, it's what you think with the notion of exactness inherited from the exact category. And Grotendieck introduced the Grotendieck group by giving generators and relations, which everyone knows there, it's the objects of the category, modulo the three term relations given by the exact sequences. So it's, it's a, an abelian group with a presentation. Now in topology, if, um, oh, maybe I should turn the light on on this thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry about the shadow. In topology, if you have a group G, then you can form the classifying space of G by putting down topological simplices. So first you put down a point, and now whenever you have a group element, you put down one simplex connecting that one point to itself. And whenever you have an equation of the form G equal to G prime, G double prime in the group, you put down a triangle connecting those three one simplices. And that gives you the start at making a topological space. And then you keep going. So I'll just write, et cetera. You keep going and glue in simplices of higher and higher dimension and eventually get a topological space called BG. And the salient feature of it is that pi one of BG is G. And you can see that the relation is um, that G turns out to be equal to G prime, G double prime in the fundamental group of this space is enforced by that two simplex. And then you do the same thing with um, the exact category M, well, an analogous thing. You put down, you start making a space and you put down a point. And whenever you have an object of the category, you, you put down an edge connecting the point to itself, and that gives you a loop at the base point. And then whenever you have a short exact sequence, you put down a two simplex, in other words, a triangle. And that enforces the relation in the fundamental group of the space that was used to define K naught. And so you get K naught, but if you keep gluing in higher and higher dimensional simplices according to the obvious pattern, which I'm not gonna describe for lack of time, you, you get a space, which I'll call in, in a non-standard way, I'll call it the classifying space of the exact category. And the K groups, are, well, what you see evidently is that K zero of the exact category is pi one of this topological space. And the higher K groups are defined to be the higher homotopy groups of this space. Any questions so far? The, the, the G should be on M, I think. Oh yeah, that G should be an M. Thank you. Uh, also, is that is the BG the same BG from Dan's 
lecture the I mean the universal thing for uh, torsos. Um, yeah, it it's the classifying space for D torsos. All right, so remember how we made that space. That's not Quillen's definition, by the way, that's Waldhausen's definition. Um, now what I wanna do is I wanna consider um, in the category M, two long exact sequences with the same objects. So I'll write down, I'm just gonna take one of length four because I have an illustration in mind, but it could be any length. So the differential maps in these two long exact sequences need not be the same, and they need not be compatible with each other in any sense, but the objects have to be the same. I'll put equal signs. And now, if you um, take the images of the differentials at the intermediate spots, for example, if we let Z2 be the image of this differential, and we let Z1 be the image of this differential, then we can start writing down some triangles because the triangles in that classifying space come from short exact sequences. So we can write down a triangle that looks like this. It has um, M4 here and M3 here and Z2 here. And then we have another triangle oriented the other way. So M2 and Z1. And then finally, we have another triangle with um, M0 and M1. And so what we get when we, what we get is a proof of the equation in the Grotenberg group that the alternating sum of the classes of the objects is equal to zero. And of course, such a proof is provided by the long exact sequence. And this is a visual way of seeing it. But now we have that other exact sequence. And um, so what we get from the first exact sequence is we get a disk whose boundary is this particular path. And the other exact sequence gives us a disk whose boundary is the same path. And so if you glue those two disks together, you get a, and think of those two disks as being, let's say the top hemisphere and the bottom hemisphere of a two dimensional sphere, then you get a map from a two dimensional sphere to the classifying space. In other words, you get an element of pi two of the classifying space, which is equal to K one of the um, exact category M. And, <clears throat> um, and of course, if the two exact sequences are equal to each other, then those two disks are the same and you get the zero element of K1. So there's a definition that I'd like to make. Definition, omega M is the, cat, is the exact category of long exact sequences. Well, pairs of long exact sequences with the same objects, I should say. Pairs of long exact sequences with the same objects. So 
So the arrows in the category are what you think. They're, they're maps from object to object that commute with the differentials in the first chain complex, and they also commute with the differentials in the second chain complex. And then I want to say modulo those where the two long exact sequences are the same. I'll abbreviate long exact sequence by LES. So the, um, once you, um, oh, and what's a short exact sequence? Well, short exact sequence in this category is what you think. It's analogous to uh, short exact sequence of chain complexes. So what do I call these pairs of long exact sequences with the same objects? That's a little bit of a, um, Uh, cumbersome term, I, I call those acyclic binary complexes. Binary refers to the fact that there are two differentials on the same graded object. And then the theorem that I'd like to describe uh, comes from iterating these things. So if you take the exact category M and you, oh, and modulo, you just flash back to here. This concept of modulo, I'm not gonna go into detail about what that means for lack of time. So then if you iterate, if you start with an exact category M and apply this construction to it, you get an exact category and you can apply it again because you, it's a, the kind of construction that applies to any exact category. And if you apply it n times, and then take the Grothe group of that, then the theorem is that this is isomorphic to the entire K group of M. And the left-hand side is an explicit presentation by generators and relations of the right-hand side. The generators are the objects of this exact category and the relations are the ones that come from the Grothe group. And so how does the proof go? The, the proof goes by examining in more detail what happens when you look at the classifying space of this omega BM. So um, what, so the proof, you, you look at the classifying space and you identify it with something related to the classifying space of M. Namely, you take the loop space of the classifying space of M and you take the connected component of that at the base point and you show that you have a homotopy equivalence between this thing and that thing. And so of course, when you take the loop space of a space, all the homotopy groups move down and pi two becomes pi one, pi three becomes pi two and so on. And so if you do that n times, the n, n plus first homotopy group moves down to position one. And so k zero of that is kn of the other thing. And, um, and then the proof of this uses some uh, techniques of Faldhausen for Faldhausen k theory. And in particular, what he, uh, popularized in his papers was a, a notion of K-theory where in addition to having an exact category, you have an, some, some sort of notion of equivalence. And the main application for me turns out to be 
you consider the category of chain complexes over a category, an exact category. And chain complexes, naturally, you have uh, the notion of a map, which might be a quasi-isomorphism of chain complexes in the sense that it induces an isomorphism on the cohomology groups, or in the sense that the mapping cone is a, an acyclic complex. So you use those theorems and you, you just juggle them around in some way and do a little bit of diagram chasing and, and this theorem pops out. And um, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Well, a comment. Um, yep. <clears throat> There's another interesting exact category that, well, isn't that well known, I guess. And that is the category of filtered modules. Uh, the, the category of graded modules over a graded ring is an abelian category, but the category of filtered modules is not. However, it's an exact category. Uh, and it's easy to see you just to take the Reese module of the filtered module, and that's a graded module over the Reese ring of the brown ring. And uh, <laughs> that, that's so I wonder if um, this work on K theory has any. Um, applications to this uh, exact category? Well, um, that's a, a very interesting question. Um, the, um, at a certain point, I back here, when I was describing the topological space that um, you make to get the classifying space of an exact category, I said, et cetera. Well, what et cetera means is you consider filtrations. And um, Quillen in his paper, Higher Algebraic K-Theory 1 did prove the theorem that the K-theory of a regular ring is isomorphic to the K-theory of the polynomial ring in one variable over that ring by considering filtered modules. And, but um, you probably have in mind filtrations where descending filtrations parameterized by the natural numbers, I suppose. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I haven't thought about that, but I'll certainly try to. Uh, perhaps in a mixed Hodge theory uh, that comes into play, mm. I think. <clears throat> Yeah, Delene has a, a paper about that, that and, and he and uh, his student, um, whose name escapes me for the moment, uh, worked quite hard because they didn't realize that the filtered modules form an, an exact category. Oh. <laughs> Did you uh, point that out to them? Uh, well, no, not directly. I I got into this subject by talking with Luke Luzi, and uh, he told me about the the paper of Deline and, and Hodge theory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, could I ask something? Uh, kind of two yeah. stupid clarifications. Uh, first, so it seems the BG construction you you made uh, the what people call the nerve of the group thought of as a one object category. Um, right, so uh, now, so so a, a priori it's hard to see how that would be the BG that we are used to thinking of, but I guess it is. Um, and, and so so that's a K pi G. I mean, it's a, it's an island space. Uh, the K G that's the one. Non vanishing fundamental group, uh, pi. Um, Right. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I guess 
Okay. The second thing, when you talk about complexes I, in exact category, I guess you mean just the filter case, admissible ones or uh, um, right, the, the factor through, um, uh, right? There's this issue of what's admissible and not every sequence of morphisms is admissible. Is that correct or am I getting confused? Well, there is an issue when considering long exact sequences. Yes, yes. And yes. Uh, for example, suppose we were just considering the exact category of free modules over a ring. And suppose that there is a non-trivial stably free module over that ring. Then you can construct a long exact sequence of free modules with um, that projective module appearing only as an image. And then this thing that I did about taking the image and splitting the the long exact sequence up and the short ones um, wouldn't work. And so there's some sort of technical trick that I had. So to that's, do. I think that the, the, it's, it's supposed to be factored through a strict epimorphism composed with a strict monomorphism, one of these things. Right. Uh -huh. So it's but, kind and, of the which are essential. Yeah, I mean, the thing that might go wrong is that th this object might not exist in the category. And so there's a technical trick using a, a theorem due to Robert Thomason that I had to use to, to surmount that issue. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, the trick involves replacing your exact category by one where you um, add to the category the objects that come by formally adding the um, images of idempotent maps, which are direct comments. What? Corobian completion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, I don't see who's talking. What's your name? Amnon. Oh, Amnon Yekwich yelling? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, that's nice. Uh, any more questions and comments? Okay, so let's thank uh, Dan again. And uh, while we are on record, uh, let me thank uh, on behalf of the organizers, all the speakers today that contributed to this event uh, in honor of Steve. Well, thank you so much. And let me say, I guess, on behalf of everyone here that uh, we've always been grateful and we are grateful to be able to count on your generosity, Steve. Well, that's wonderful. And um, Beverly prepared this sign for me. I don't know if you can read it, but it's an invitation 10 years from now to, to <laughs> celebration. Well, we'll uh, certainly all be there. We're, all, we're definitely, yeah, yeah, we, 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 sure. we plan we're on being there hard. in person. In person. Uh, in, in person, person. next time. <laughs> yeah. All right, so stop recording now.